Blitz is defined as a sudden, savage attack. It is indeed all this. The effect is sure. The premise is simple. It's a basic, primal confrontation, man to man. No excuses are offered. None except. Welcome to the latest edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. Looks like a radio station. Now, here are your hosts, lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Pure athlete, yeah. I transcend race, hombre. Matt Butler. I don't talk <laughs> man. I back it up. And we are talk full of that, man. That's right. And Jeff Howe. It's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line. Because Stone Cold sets so. up. If you're going to blitz, come strong. But don't come at all. Well, I'll tell you what. More... Than the three of us in this room, four, including Travis behind the camera. More than anybody out there thought possible, Texas brought it in the Coliseum. And it was an entertaining game. It was a great game to be on the sideline for there at the end. Texas falls short to USC 27-24 in double overtime. And the score gives you an indication that we've got a lot to dissect and talk about here on this week's edition of Longhorn Blitz with Horns247.com. I am Jeff Howell. Let me bring in the rest of the team so we don't waste any more time. He is the master of the soundboard, the drop machine extraordinaire, Matt Butler. Matt, how was your weekend? A uh, great weekend. It was better because of that Texas game. It was one of those days, like we're talking to Travis on the way in, it was the first time where you had a Saturday that even though the result maybe wasn't what you expected, it was sort of the back to, oh, my day just didn't get my heart ripped out for a second where you actually were happy and the rest of your day went on and, Enjoyed seeing the way a game was played. The third member of our team who has played in many, many games, many great games, made plays to win some of those games for the Longhorns back in his day. Lifetime Longhorn, 2002 UT All-American. Rod, that's where you're supposed to jump in and talk about the uh, game you had against Oklahoma State. Uh, yeah, this is true. No, it was a yeah. good game. It was a great game. But I gave up a play in that game that put us in that position. See, so. uh, I had to bail uh, myself and our team out of the crap I put us in. He's yeah. his own worst critic. Self-critical. You know. But he's a renaissance man Honest. here on Longhorn Blitz. Lifetime Longhorn, 2002 UT All-American. 2002 semifinalist for the Jim Thorpe Award. Fourth-round draft choice of the New York Giants back in 2003. Spent his NFL career with the Giants, Lions, Bears, Bucks, Broncos. And a year with the Hamilton Tiger Cats of the CFL. Could have been a CFL Hall of Famer. This is true. If he had a T-ring, he would wear it proudly. We need to make that happen. <laughs> Tom Herman, Fernando Lovo, if you're listening, help Rodney get his T-ring. <laughs> yeah. no, number 21 in your program. Some say the greatest number 21 in the history of the Texas program, but he will always be number one in your hearts, Mr. Rod Babers. It's great intro, brother. I appreciate it. Yeah, greatest number 21 in football history. Yes, this is true. absolutely. We have to, we have to yeah. preface that. Yeah, yeah. On the gridiron. Break, yeah, on the gridiron. Exactly. Yeah, I don't want the uh, yeah the baseball. Guys I don't want Jason Klotz getting mad. <laughs> yeah. But. Well, and then when you just brought up that you had to bail yourself out whenever you saved the Oklahoma State, it reminded me of what Phil oh, yeah. Dawson had to do yesterday because Phil Dawson got the game-winning field goal, but it was only there because he had missed he had the missed chance it. of the game-winning field goal before it. That's the way it works, man. And yeah. yeah, the play that I had to make in the game. I mean, that was a it was actually that was a play in the Oklahoma State game. Not you bring it up that I had to make right after I gave up. I think I gave up the touchdown, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was and a touchdown. And then the two-point conversion. The two-point conversion was the play that Coach Aquino said was a much better play than the actual pick that saved the game because he said you have to come right back. You just got burnt, and it came right back at your game. They were like, oh, they, they wanted to find, as Coach Aquino would say, you know, let me make sure I, uh, the, can we blank out this uh, word? And just go. Bitch assness. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> You're fine on yeah. that one. They wanted to find that. And I was like, uh, yeah. They wanted, they wanted to try to get it in me. And I was like, no. And I stopped on the two-book conversion. I like that he invented that it. word at that second. No, he <laughs> did. That, that been, that's been out there for a while. They people just made it. As to the, yeah. I like the, the, at the end. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. As a term. Yeah. I'm throwing that in my Google machine right now. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Urban Dictionary. Yeah, Urban Dictionary. Mm-hmm. Urban Dictionary defines it as coin turned by Diddy on making the band. There you go. Ah. It's been o- out there for a while. Overall yeah. stank actions towards others through words, facial expressions, and or song. Symptoms yeah. include thinking you're better than those around you, not speaking your true feelings, throwing large amounts of shade. There you go. Man, I go really on. like that uh, Kina ahead of his time, pulling <laughs> that out back in the day. I'm sure we were using it around him. Yes, that's did. awesome. <laughs> oh, he's got kids too, though. Yes. Yeah, he does. Uh-huh. I see. Yeah. 
Well, guys, uh, I don't know where we want to start um, with breaking down Texas USC. And uh, actually, I, I do know where I want to start before the game. It's a lot of places uh, to start before we before we get to the game. Um, I, I really do want to start here. And uh, I know this isn't the way we typically want to start a podcast, or yeah. we usually do, but I feel the need to. Um, in the uh, in the Austin media market, and not just Austin, it goes well beyond Austin. Uh, we lost a good friend, a good man, a good colleague in Sean Adams unexpectedly last week. And uh, you know, Rod, I know you and I texted, and it was just surreal. Would probably be the best word I could use to describe kind of the emotions when I got the phone call last Thursday yeah. and just you sit at your desk and you just think a lot and it's just hard to process uh, for the first 24 hours or so. But, uh, you know, I, I know people out there, not everybody agreed with Sean's opinions. That's part of what we do in the media industry. Not everybody's going to agree with everything we say. But I will say this, and I feel like I can say this, and it's unequivocally the truth. Uh, Sean Adams had the respect of all of his colleagues and, and everybody that covers Texas in this market. Um, you know, Sean and I talked a lot. We sat next to each other several games during the year in the press box, and, and Sean was always on the road trips. And uh, I enjoyed our conversations. Uh, Rod, I know you worked with Sean at the Zone. Uh, we shared a studio with Sean and Chip. Uh, always running into those guys. And uh, needless to say, uh, you know, at the very least, the, the, the Sean will be missed. Um, taken from us far too soon and uh you know i I just it's it's sad that we have to talk about it but at the same time just remembering the amount of respect sean commanded how everybody felt about him um and the way he made you feel when you were around him i think that more than anything uh is what i'll take from sean adams never a bad word to say to me was always professional with me and, and up front and uh i will miss him that press box was a little bit emptier in the Coliseum on Saturday, and I can't say enough about Tim Teslon and the sports media staff, sports information staff at USC, reserving his seat. Nobody sat in it. They had a, a, a place marker there for him where Sean was supposed to sit on Saturday. Um, just to, words can't describe the, the loss, and I, I know Chip and, and Sean's family and his friends are going through a lot right now, and uh, my thoughts and prayers, I think I speak for the three of us, our, our thoughts and prayers are with Sean yeah. and his family. Rod, is there anything you want to add? Um, I mean, no, not really. I mean, it's it's been pretty. I mean, everybody's echoed the same sentiment, and it's been a pretty consistent uh, kind of narrative since this tragedy took place. Is that Sean Adams was a kind-hearted soul and a good guy, and he had an impact on a lot of people's lives, and it was a positive impact on a ton of people's lives. And I, I didn't even know. I mean, I saw the ESPN uh, during some of the broadcasts on Friday. Mm-hmm. They were mentioning it. Uh, doing some of the college foot, doing doing one of the college football broadcasts. They mentioned you brought up a USC. Um, I think at his alma mater uh, there at Abilene Christian, they had a moment of silence. Uh, it was one of those things where if you had an interaction with Sean Adams, even for a brief period, or you were lucky enough to, like me to call him a colleague uh, and call him a friend and a mentor, he had this this profound effect on you that he either challenged you to be better or he would inspire you to be better and um yeah man it's he, he was going way too soon it's uh, my thoughts prayers go out to his family and you know his wife and his daughter and his son um that that that's just tragic for them i know all the lessons i learned from sean just on a daily basis so i know his kids will have a good foundation because if he was preaching that much to me hell i know he was preaching a lot to them exactly yeah. uh, you know what i mean and uh he always left something better than the way he found it. He was a uh, he was a good guy, man. And the lesson learned is, it ain't guaranteed, and it goes fast. And hell, it could be. I mean, that guy was a picture of health to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it happened to him for whatever reason. Um, we should all be very, very cognizant of our own lives and the 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 loved ones that we have, and tell them that you care about them. Hell, it may be you, it may be them. You never know. You know, because I didn't that that it blew me. It, it hit. I actually, when for, the first person who told me, I, <laughs> I, I kind of, I like, I didn't cuss them out, but I, I said something to them that was very derogatory at the time, because I, I thought they were like, I thought it was like it a joke. Real. Yeah. I like, thought it was like fake news. I was, and I was like, what the are you talking about, man? Yeah, why, don't... why would you, what are you, what are you talking about? Yeah. And it was like, no, that's it's real. Um, because I just, it just didn't, it didn't. Right now, it just hard. It was so hard to process at the time. Mm-hmm. So. 
um, yeah, I mean, it's heartbreaking. There's, there's nothing else to really say about it. It's really heartbreaking. No, exactly. He's a guy that's just a genuine guy. I had a few interactions with him, but you could tell, like, with this, he lived life how you would want somebody to live life. He lived it loving, and he lived it as a genuine person. I yeah. mean, the only time I remember when I was an intern, I used to let him in the door back in the old Bucky and Aaron rooms, and it had been years that we hadn't seen each other. He's back in the building, and the first time he comes up, he's like, I'll do a really good show, and he didn't need to do that. He just came up to talk and give you, like, he was a genuine guy that liked to interact and talk to people yeah. and like he just he's the one that wanted to make everything else better and you hear people say that about people but you could tell he's a genuine person that just really liked to live life to the fullest and to make sure everybody else is looking at and thinking about life the way you want to live it yep i think that's that's my best memories of sean is you know that i can remember the first time he told me and i didn't really know sean all that well at the time this is right after i really started on the team beat uh, came up to me at a press, just randomly at a press conference after it was over, and we're getting ready to go into the media scrum with the players, and he shook my hand. He said, hey, I just want to let you know you do really good work, and I really respect your work. Mm. And that means a lot, somebody who commands as much respect as Sean, to be able to for him to, to go out of his way to say that um, really means a lot. Yeah. So uh, he will be missed. Um, I, yep. I guess to kind of to honor him, um, some of the media folks, we decided to start a new tradition. Um, however long the press conference structure on Mondays with Tom Herman works, um, we're going to go have a meal as a group uh, after yeah. that's over. So we went out today and myself and uh, Kirk Bowles and Cedric Golden and uh, some of the TV guys, Bob Ballou and Anthony Geronimo from KI, and some of the guys from Spectrum. That's cool. Uh, went out and had a meal. So I think we're going to try to try to keep that going every week, every Monday. So Nice. Um Again, thoughts and prayers with Sean's family, and uh, um, I think we're there's going to be some things in the work. We and what the cool thing about this is, um, you know, Rod, we talked about this with the hurricane. I know you being in H Town, you've seen mm-hmm. this uh, in times of tragedy. It's really, yeah. it's really interesting and really cool how people kind of come together that you don't normally come together. And uh, I coordinated with Jason Sukamil and the guys at Orange Bloods. Uh, we locked our message board for five minutes on. Uh, on Saturday yeah. as a kind of our, a moment of silence, no posting on the message board. Our social media accounts went dark for, for five minutes yeah. in coordination with those guys. And um, I believe, uh, you know, uh, us at Horns 24-7, the guys at Orange Bloods, uh, and also I got to commend uh, Eric Nolan and the guys at Inside Texas. I think, uh, you know, as soon as kind of everything – kind of settles down a little bit. I think we're all going to work on some type of, of fundraising type deal. I'm not sure what we're going to do yet Good still idea. in the early goings, but we we you know we want to do something because, you know, in our home office, I mean, guys guys in the 24-7 sports home office worked with Sean and knew Sean when Sean mm-hmm. was at Rivals. And, Small uh, family. Yeah, it's it's yeah, they, really, yeah. you know, it's it's like you said, Rod, it's almost a, an incestuous relationship you have with people when you get into the media world. Yeah, especially, well, especially Austin media. I mean, everybody is pretty much covering Texas football this uh, you know, the entity of Texas football and you not know, Texas sports, I should say, period. But uh, the athletic department, all that, it's such uh, it's it's such its own kind of arm of this the sports right. industrial complex that there are other entities literally that are built entirely that their entire purpose is just to cover Texas football. It's all they do. Mm-hmm. Like That's how much people care about it. That's the passion people have about it. Most of us in this town are linked because of that that passion and because of that relationship. So that binds us all together, but that brings us together for so many different events all the time. Mm -hmm. Hell, you end up seeing these people as much as you see your actual family at home. You know what I mean? And then you're like, man, and something happens like that, and it it hits you way harder than you think it's going to hit you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And me and Sean were close, of course, but it just, yeah, it, it was devastating to hear it like that. And I agree with you. It's unfortunate but that usually bring, usually brings people together because they start to understand, man, there are certain things in this life that matter, and relationships certain things that don't matter. Yeah, relationships with people it matters. Like yeah. those, you, know, you take it for granted. Yep. You would get to see Sean every day and say what's up and talk about I don't know whatever he's talking about that day, Tupac or mm-hmm. uh, what you know hip hop or he's complaining about the quarterback situation or he's dropping some life lesson on you. Uh, you take that for granted, and I think we all did. I think I just missed the handshake and the, hey, you doing good? You yeah, doing okay? Whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we're going to go on with the show now. But uh, as I said, thoughts and prayers with Sean and his family. And uh, Sean is gone, but he will definitely not be forgotten. Uh, left too big of an impact while he was here Agreed. Uh, on this world. Life mm-hmm. well lived. Yeah. Sean would have loved what happened in the Coliseum on Saturday night, man. I got to, I was on the field uh, for that last 90-yard drive in the fourth quarter by the offense and on the field for both overtimes. <laughs> 
and you talk about the noise, the the intensity. Uh, it's everything you would think a matchup between two blue bloods like Texas and USC should be very similar. Right to the end of the Notre Dame game last year, in terms of how it felt uh, being down there in the thick of it, Texas comes up short, and it's interesting to see how the fan base has reacted to the game because yeah. I think while while over the overwhelming majority of Texas fans are happy that not only did Texas compete better than anybody thought they would, they had a chance to actually win the game and push the number four team in the country in their own backyard to the absolute limit. But I think there's also a portion of the fan base that now that the loss has had a chance, you've had a chance to digest it mm-hmm. and the kind of the come down from the emotion and, and yeah. all of that from Saturday. I think a lot of the anchors is now directed towards the offense and what the heck happened? Why did it bog down so much? How does Chris Warren only get four carries? What are you going to do with this offensive line now that it's a – you can honestly say this offensive line's a liability now yeah. with no Connor Williams. Rod, think about this offensively, and this is where I want to start the conversation. Going into the season, if, you, if you'd asked me, what's the worst-case scenario the Texas offense could be? And I, and I would tell you, no Shane Bouchelle, no Connor Williams – because I don't know what you do at that point. Mm. And it's the second play of the second quarter against USC on the road, and boom, you're in a worst-case scenario. No Shane Bouchelle, no Connor Williams. I want to start by asking this, Rod. We'll get into Chris Warren. We'll get into all that. What, What would you have done if you were the offensive coordinator, knowing Connor Williams is out, you don't have Shane Bouchelle? What's your game plan at that point? Uh, well, I think it's kind of football common sense. A lot of people would think that if your best lineman is out and you're already dealing with a depleted offensive line because Patrick Hudson is out and Elijah Rodriguez went down before the season even started. Gene DeLance transfers. Gene DeLance transfers. Yeah, I forgot about that one. So you're already dealing with depleted depth on the offensive line. We all know it's easier to run block than it is to pass block, period. The more skill, the deeper you go down that depth chart, those guys are less and less skilled pass blockers. But, hey, man, you, it's easier for that guy to be a, uh, you know, a kind of a road grader than it is for him to be a skilled pass blocker. That's just number one. That's kind of going back to kind of football basics, all right, uh, football one-on-one. And you have a true freshman quarterback in there starting. True freshman quarterback, you would like to take pressure off a true freshman quarterback. You don't want to put too much pressure on them. You don't want them to have to, uh, you know, throw the ball. You want them to be in manageable situations. And, and you know, you could, your, your playbook is condensed, too, which kind of lends itself to more to running the football. You're talking about expansive playbook. You were talking about an advanced passing concepts uh, and all that kind of stuff. So with all those things being said, I think that it was obvious, at least I thought it was obvious, that Texas was going to run the ball. Even going into that game versus USC, the number one thing to exploit versus that USC defense was their rush defense. 110th in the country in rush defense, and they were 118th in yards per rush allowed. They were a mediocre rush defense anyway, and on top of that, they had front seven guys dropping like flies. Cameron Smith, starting middle linebacker, ended up getting leaving the game at one point. Port Augustine tried to play. He actually was really effective when he did play. Yeah. He had two, like a sack and a half or two sacks. But then he ended up leaving the game. They had other guys. That, so with the depletion on the front seven for them and all the other things I mentioned, you thought it would have been like, man, they're salivating at a 250-pound running back just sitting back there one fresh and ready eight. to go. And that was not the case. So now we've noticed a troubling trend when the fit hits the shan, if you will, when it, it, it's a really a kind of, of a, heated, a heated moment in the game where momentum could go either way or you're, you're a one-possession game getting into the fourth quarter, that Tim Beck and, and Mays, Tom Herman, too, that they not only abandon the running game, that they take it out in the backyard, shoot it dead, and bury it. <laughs> they, they don't want nothing to do with it. Both times, the quarterbacks, Shane Bouchelle and Sam Ellinger, have ended up leading the team in rush attempts and pass attempts. And now you get with a, a, a situation where Sam Ellinger versus USC had more combined rushing attempts, and this is without sacks, than your two top running backs, Chris Warren and Kyle Porter. So we know you don't really like Chris Warren, but now you don't like mm-hmm. Kyle Porter either. So at this point, you don't trust anybody to run the ball except for your true freshman quarterback. 
And so, so what you're saying is the uh, the running wow. game, the running game to Tim Beck and Tom Herman wow. is the rabid dog that you had to just put out of its misery. Oh yeah, right? old Yelly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> but, well, yeah, it's a good point. I guess that is it. I don't but, know what the hell is going on. I could on. put this on top because I agree with everything that you're saying. And when I looked at all the numbers, because in the first quarter you end up running it six times, pass it only three times, and then you come out run it the first two plays of the second. So you're obviously running with Connor Williams, but Connor Williams gets hurt at that 14:35 yeah. mark, and I agree, you don't. Want want to necessarily abandon it because of it being that you don't have you can still run block over pass blocking but the main reason I think that they go to the QB run game at that point is just the sheer numbers game that if you know if you're deficient on the front line you're already out you used to if you're handing the ball off you're not only taking the running back out from being a blocker but the quarterback so now you have nine guys out front blocking for one runner this way the numbers game he is at least snapping to the guy with the ball can have 10 blockers and it's the traditional reason why you have the mismatch in the first place when you go to the QB run game. So I think this is them maybe being a little too worried, knowing, okay, well, if we're out Williams, we definitely still have to run the ball. How can we do that if our line can't block? Okay, let's ha- add another blocker with the running back and run the guy. So, I mean, in that situation, why not have heard? And it's say, like, I know, but look, look, yeah. I went across the whole game, all three quarters, the only runs that were over four yards, Heard, Ellinger, Foreman, Ellinger, Ellinger. It's the only time that they were having any yeah. success. No, no other runs back ran could four, run more than four, five yards. Of, not even yeah. five. They yeah. didn't even get there. It was yeah. four or scrimmage. less or three or negative yeah. yards. So I just think that you had that commitment at the beginning. Eight of the first 11 plays were run plays. That was whenever Williams went out. After that, when they tried to run, it became a little too predictable because you were trying to do the QB run game just to get yourself the additional blocker because you don't have faith in the guys going basically nine on 11 if you're handing the ball off and taking Ellinger out of it and handing it off to a guy that was going to be a blocker. So I think that is where they went that direction. I wish they would have maybe made some better decisions, but I think that's at least why I, they did I understand. It. I understand the logic, Matt. My frustration is they didn't, Rod, they didn't even try. Yeah, and that does not explain Maryland. Yeah. So I understand no, what no, you're no, saying I about agree, this totally. one. I that does not explain why they also abandoned the running Matt, game Matt, when the Matt, Phoenix Matt, versus I, Maryland. I appreciate the effort, Matt, trying yeah. to apply logic well, that's a good, to it. No, 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 I mean, this I, is I, logical. Very, this is why it makes you do perfect it sense. Trying to apply good, logic to yeah. an illogical situation because exactly. I have no damn explanation. Or the why best of bad. It's another argo. What's your best of the bad ideas? No, no. What Lohan fans are upset about is what they notice as a trend, a troubling trend that they don't like, which is now the Maryland game and this USU game. So I agree with your premise about, you know, schematically – uh, it makes sense in a numbers That's, game, yeah. but that does not explain Maryland. So that does not explain Agreed. the troubling trend no, developing you're, with you're Tim You're spot Beck. on with that. That's the issue. Yeah, that is a and big issue. And the issue with Chris Warren. Like, because I think those are two totally different issues. Mm-hmm. I think their inability to uh, have a sufficient running game is, or establish a sufficient running game is different than them not trusting or liking Chris Warren. And True. And maybe they have just contributed to the same like basically the same result, which is just having a one dimensional uh, subpar running game in, I don't know, late in the game in fourth quarters in one possession games. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, but I, I don't think anybody knows this. Yeah, point. right now. They told it, us Warren and Porter are interchangeable for, from what <laughs> they say. So they they can all do the same thing. Strengths, I would say, are much different for the two of you. But they didn't like either one of them versus USC. Right. Gave up on both of them. And I think that's more indicative of the inability to move the line up front that they just – I don't think they have the faith in the – a whole run game as a whole, maybe if you're pointing to a specific thing, the offensive line as a unit. But let's go. Let's roll with. Uh, let's roll with Matt's theory because that's as good as I've heard anybody explain at this point, and it makes total sense. You're talking about the numbers game, trying to give yourself an advantage when you don't have your best line, right? Yeah. On the fly, yeah, unexpected. That to me, then that becomes. Let's say that's what the staff was thinking, right? Say that's what they thought. Then that to me is irresponsible game planning because game planning because you've got one healthy quarterback. One. And you're going to run him 10, 15 times on quarterback runs? What hap- What do you What do? You They're do just with- trying to win the game at what- that point, I guess, you know. Then use Gerard Hurd. No, I agree. What do you have him back there for? I guess he doesn't have faith in him. Then, wh- then why even put him back there? It's a great. Those are all nope. good questions. You're right. I agree with you. I mean, Hurd, you know, Hurd, the Hurd, only he- run for f- at least five yards in the whole first half was a Hurd run, yeah. and he g- was in there at times. That would, be like, that would be like me saying, Ah, gosh, you know, I don't trust Matt to produce our show. Then why do you have him producing the show? <laughs> Agreed. No, I agree. You need.
Then well, I'll find another role for Matt to do. Yeah. I'll have him and Travis swap places, whatever. Like, it, <laughs> hey, what's up, man? Maybe they didn't want to disrupt the rhythm that the young quarterback was getting to. Maybe they felt like they had done that in the game a few times and disrupted his rhythm and kind of hurt his confidence that he was gaining. And maybe they felt late in the game, let's Gerard her, let's just go with Ellinger. Because Ellinger, we did watch him grow. Oh, that third quarter looked one through, really good. Yeah, those, like, I, I, I mean, I saw it. I, it was crazy, but we saw it. There were things that – he could not handle in the first quarter that you've seen him handle better late in the game and third, especially in the fourth quarter when he, he kind of blew up and he became a man before our very eyes. So maybe t- as the game went on, I haven't looked at exactly when those rushes are that Matt mm-hmm. brought up, but maybe as the game went on, they decide, you know what, we're trusting Ellinger more with it. All, yeah. all of it, even the running back, run the quarterback running game, and even in the passing game, We'll just let – I don't want to disrupt the young man. I don't want to interrupt his flow. He's feeling it right now. Let him go. Rod B., here's my issue, too, with, with the running back situation. When you, you're, you're talking about the quarterback run game and you're talking about how, you know, how you're going to use Sam Ellinger and this, that, and the other, that to me doesn't explain the other troubling trend I'm notice, noticing on offense when, it, when you talk about the two power five teams they played against. Yeah. It doesn't explain why this team, it's either play calling or situational execution – on third and fourth down in the, in the red zone, that's so bad Man. in short yardage situations. Yeah, like the first fourth down, I I actually agreed with the idea of I was, I'm sounding yeah. ex, I'm saying exactly what I said in the Maryland game. I agree with the decision to go for it right there, to the extent that Tom. I know Tom. Now, if the it first, was this is the first quarter, yes. right? So, now, if it was rate. if it was yep. me, if it was me, I would have taken the points. We know Tom Herman's an aggressive guy. You know he's going to go for it. Binder be damned. That's his nature. He's going to go for it. My problem was that was your play call on fourth and short? Like you're trying to like run some kind of zone read action for Sam Ellinger? Yeah. It was, it was. It was. Yeah. I, 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 I actually, when he first tackled him, I thought it was. I was like, they must have missed the fake. What's the? <laughs> they, they must have missed the ball. Like, no, it was just. It was really. And I'll go back squad. and dissect the play, but I was like, that was your. It's like a quarterback that was your call? power. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. What the and you go, you go to later in the game, and now they did. I, I, it, I was on the in the press box for one, on the sideline for for the other, on the fourth and short, on the ninety, yeah. on the ninety plus yard drive. It looked like they ran the same play that they had ran earlier in the they game. Have, did they have anybody in motion? I, I think they did, that. yeah. I think they did. Did, did they Matt's have it on, on the first up. one? Did they have it on the first I one? I believe they did, yeah. Okay. So it worked the second time, didn't work the first time, whatever. But you get into situations like Tom Herman saying in the overtime period, did you think about going for two? And he said no because the throwback pass to Cade Brewer, which that was Cedric Gold and I were standing next to each other. When we saw Ellinger roll right, right, they're throwing it back against the grain. Who's going to be the guy? And right then, boom, we see Cade Brewer break yeah. open. That was their two-point play. My thought is, it's first and goal at the three. I'm pretty sure Chris Warren can get you three yards on three or four cracks right he there. He did average three point eight yards per carry. Yeah, Boom. right in the wheelhouse. <laughs> Math. So, you know, two you feet to spare. Get in the end zone. <laughs> get in the end zone, and maybe you save that two point play because at that point, I w- I w- I would have thought as aggressive as Tom Herman is, since at that point the defense I think had just worn down at that point because. USC marches down the field on that last drive. They score yeah. on the first play in overtime. At that point, and I'll I'll throw this in here, and this is the only time you will hear me reference this guy's football acumen uh, in terms of it being positive. When I covered Baylor, I got to know Guy Morris. I, I love I love Guy Morris, mm-hmm. and I know Coach Morris is dealing with some health issues, so thoughts and prayers with him. But um, Baylor's playing A&M in 2004, and it's an overtime game. A- Baylor hadn't beaten A&M at that point since, like, 1986. <laughs> and it's funny because we're talking about Art Bryles before we came on yeah. air, and this is like where Baylor football was shortly before those days, he the got Care there. Bears. Yes, uh, as my brother called them, the Honey Bears. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they're playing A and M, and they decide to go for two, no hesitation. They're scoring overtime. They're going for two in the win. And Guy Morris's explanation was, and I'll never forget the quote. He said, "When you're in our situation, you're an underdog. You played them better than even probably your kids thought they could play, and you got a chance to go in the ball game. You go drop the hammer." <laughs> So that's always if if I was in Tom Herman's shoes, I probably would have gone for two right there. But they burned their two point play scoring. Yeah. So, but yeah, it's like if you would have thought about that earlier, and and managed your offense a little bit better, and maybe gone to Chris Warren right there to get you three yards on maybe three or four yeah. cracks. 
just keep that keep uh, and or maybe kick the field goal. And yeah. one that's the, another one, option too, right? In the first quarter, instead of going for one of the things I, I like that well, SC got the well, SC scored first, so they had to get the touchdown. No, I'm talking about the beginning of the game. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about the, talking the first there. quarter. Okay, yeah. yeah. taking points. I'm talking about I'm talking the, about the game yeah. of 27 24. Right. You passed up three points. Right. I'm talking, yeah, yeah. I'm <laughs> talking about the overtime. You know what I mean? But you know, with bro, a freshman quarterback, that you could act, you could put points on the board and mm-hmm. a defense that's playing lights out. Right. They could have played with a lead. Going and back to using some Brian Harson logic, yeah. uh, one of the things he always talked about that I liked, and it was to his detriment and my sanity at times. So you, know, you go into a game, there's always two or three silver bullets you've got stored away for a special occasion, and mm-hmm. you don't touch those unless you get to that scenario in that situation. Yeah. In other words, we like, we we think we can really have success with this double reverse pass, mm-hmm. but we're only going to do it if we get into yeah, yeah. this scenario. Statue of Liberty, and if that that's your two-point yeah, play, yeah. then save that for your two-point play. Just yeah. trust your 255-pound back that he can get you three yards on four different cracks. Dude, they don't like that guy. I don't mm-hmm. care. They don't like him. Still. At least right. so in this simple. situation. It's that simple. We can what, stop talking about it like, like it's some well, football. I some, know they don't. But why does that even matter? Missing. They don't like. No, it does matter. It matters well, because and I think you they, brought in Tom Harmon, the guy to change the culture. You want him to change the culture based on his opinions, things. And now, I'm not saying I agree with it, but I'm saying his opinion is right now. And he can say all he wants. He can tap dance around all he wants to about uh, 3.8 yards of carry. And we got to do more to give him the ball. The Man. eye laceration didn't come up today, by right. the way, like it did after the game. All right. You're eye telling left. me a guy, this guy has. Yeah, eye laceration. That's what. The, oh, yeah. I know that's the newest Ooh, one that somebody that poked him in the suck. eye. Anyway, it's pretty obvious and pretty transparent. They don't like him or trust him. It was obvious versus Maryland when he only got, what, six carries. Mm-hmm. And it's obvious now when he only get four carries versus USC. They didn't forget about him. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not for buying the poke in the eye thing because I saw him later in the game. They trusted him to go block. They don't like him. They don't trust him for whatever reason. I don't know what it is. Well, they, it could just be a, he's a bad they, – they think he's, uh, he's a bad practice That's what player. they say. And remember, Armonte Foreman, who's bad been balling out, too. all right, and we all agree Armonte Foreman should be on the damn field more. Mm-hmm. He's, got, he's got a touchdown in every game they played. All right, he's been balling. Up behind Colin Johnson, he's the best receiver they got production-wise, all right? Yeah. And yet – uh, even Tom Harmon admitted today, mm-hmm. he said, oh, no, he's a bad, he's a terrible practice Both player. That's why I didn't pay him. So I don't know. I think going to Chris Warren, I don't know if he's been a bad practice player or if he doesn't like the fact that he hasn't been durable enough, he hasn't bought in. Whatever the reason is, mm-hmm. Tom Harmon and that staff don't like Chris Warren. And they're, they're using him all right, as an example. Yeah. yeah to everybody in that program. Foundation. You can be cold, but if you don't buy into my program, you will not play. And that's, that's that's just my theory. My yeah. theory. That's, I'm, I'm just I looking at what that. I'm just looking at it because I'm with you. 250 pound run. Both of the guys. It's pretty damn obvious he should be playing. In some I don't situation. give a damn if he's a bad guy. I gotta win this game. Exactly. exactly. True. No, no, no. That's, that's why I think it goes deep. That's why I think it's deep. It's like, hey, yeah. everybody look because everybody in locker room knows should be playing. Everybody in locker room. Yeah. Knows it's can a long term. Hey, but you will not play for me if you don't buy in. If you if you don't buy into what I'm saying, this guy will micromanage everything down to your piss color, okay? Right. Mm-hmm. So you, and then he's all of a sudden, oh, we just lost Chris Warren in the shuffle. Our bad. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right, dog. I don't believe that for a second, and y'all shouldn't either. No, it's ex- right? you're spot on. He's That's talked about truth. it, they and he's been like transparent him. now. You can take it a grain of salt of what they say in press conferences and what to believe, but it seems like he's pretty honest about that. He, you got to show up, and he even said it about Bouchel. It was like, well, Bouchel, uh, we got 10 more days, so we got to see how he practices until then. So with that situation, you know, you see those guys, and maybe it will be better for the long term. But as you say, Jeff, it's frustrating now whenever you're at the three and you're trying to pl- plunge it in and you don't have the happened. guy. But at least in that case, I would say look at the numbers, to Put too. Kyle Porter in the game. Put well, Daniel I know, but in the game. What I see, you can't make Kyle Porter happen. Kyle Porter, he, he can't make it happen. I love Kyle Porter, but Kyle Porter – can't change games like that. You're a like Division One running back. If you can't get three yards on four different cracks, then quit. You've seen Kyle well, Porter. No, you know I, he's it, not I think that it's explosive. more, though, about the offensive just line than just the skill it's players. It's three freaking yards. Well, I know, and that's three why they yards. use and you what, and they used the play back. action. Who's averaging 3.8? Who you don't Boom. like. I know I'm not a mathematician, but I think Chris Warren can get you three freaking yards averaged, on first and goal at the three. He averaged five yards per carry versus, versus Maryland. He averaged 10 yards per carry versus San Jose State. Almost four versus USC. Average nine yards of carry going into the USC game. You won't use them on what? What did you say it was? What was it? First four? and goal at the three. At First least they did the score, though. They, they don't play like that and guy. They yeah, guys, I don't know. Listen, I think it's what, productive. What's, what's, it's a great, I know they don't like him. There's a great book. Uh, there's a great book. It made it to a movie called He's Just Not Into You. 
Yeah. Because they because it is trying to explain to women who want to know oh, why why didn't this guy call me? Why didn't this guy do that? Why did he uh why did he text me at three in the morning but didn't text me the next day? Why didn't this guy why did he make me pay for dinner when we went on a date? And it, and and the book is a thick book, but it all boils down to one damn thing to answer all those women's questions about all their uncertainty about the opposite sex. That guy just ain't into you because if a guy really likes you. You will know. But yeah. you know You what? will know. He will make the commitment. He will make the effort. They don't like this guy. But do you know what? Ag- <laughs> you know what <laughs> right now, but if no, he practices listen, well, I bet in five maybe days they'll like him. That's right why now, it's his absolute. Like here's, what, here's what they don't part, want him out Here's there. what partially yeah. shoots the theory we're talking about down. Go to the second the second overtime possession. Third and seven at the USC 22. You know what the play is? An 11-yard pass, Sam Ellinger or Chris Warren for a freaking first down. No, that shoots down the theory about the eye thing. That it was, that they poked in the eye. <laughs> then why? If you don't like him, why is he on the field in a critical no situation? You got no option. Then don't pee on my leg and tell me it's raining. <laughs> Put him on the field on first to go with the three. We are, we are yelling at each other, but Give we agree. Give him the damn ball. We agree. Well, it's so funny because <laughs> the what he's so upset about is the yeah. position where they scored. I didn't scored. think I was going to get mad during this podcast. It's funny. No, Good Lord. But it, no, it's so absurd that... They they want us to believe that ah we just forget like like you got all of these like all these great playmakers on offense you just gonna forget about your two hundred fifty five running back. like this is Texas two thousand five where a two hundred fifty five running back gets lost in the bench somewhere you know what I mean like no this isn't like shoving <laughs> Selvin Young aside hey Jamal Charles is really good yeah. so <laughs> Selvin you might not get as many carries this week exactly. So I'm saying they, they, I don't know what, I mean, I'm not saying like, I, you know, I, I spoke to somebody, this is my theory, they don't, I, I know football enough to know it's a meritocracy, mm-hmm. and the best players play, especially against USC, and oh. they did not want him out there, they don't trust him, whether it's a trust, going back to what Matt and I were talking about, about the, he's a bad practice player, maybe when, Char, maybe when Tom Herman got there, he told him, I like Charlie Strong better, I don't know what the hell happened, okay, but. They don't like that young man. They don't like him as a football player. All right. Let's kind of move off from Chris Warren for a second before I – The curious a, case of Chris Warren the third. Before man. I stroke out on the we, podcast. We've had these kind of frustrating players like DJ, DJ Deontay Monroe. Deontay Foreman two years ago. Deontay Foreman. Marquise Goodwin was like that for a while. Well, we feel like, Jonathan Gray. DJ. Don't pee on my leg and yeah. tell me it's raining. And I don't use yeah. that analogy Why a lot. Why can't you but get that guy to remember the hash, remember the hash mark excuse? Don't, don't please don't. Yeah, please don't. Yeah, <laughs> DJ, I had that brought up to me today. <laughs> it was a hash mark. Oh, really? <laughs> Ten flat hundred meter guy, Olympic long jumper, and the ball's got to be on the right damn hash mark. See, I just praised Brian Harson, Rod, and you just bring it back to where I got to dump on Coach Harson again. Oh man, no, this is Tim. We dump oh. on Tim Beck here. Now. Okay, so here's my issue with Tim Beck. This is the trend, and this goes back to every the big knock I heard against Tim Beck, and I don't really. You know, you talk to people around the Ohio State program, and you can only put so much of their issues on Tim Beck. Which, by the way, go back and watch the OU game. Tim Beck's gone; they're still having the same issues. So that That's is, true. you know. Take that for what it's worth. But you talk to people in Nebraska about Tim Beck, and people in Nebraska told me that if covered this guy, were around him. Hey, if he had his druthers, he would throw it every single play if he could. Mm. That's just his nature. Man's got a rep. And I go back to rep. I know I keep talking about it, but Tim Beck said the purest game he ever called was that Holiday Bowl, his last game in Nebraska against USC. And with Tommy Armstrong as his quarterback, he threw the ball 52 times against USC. And and I brought that up today, and (laughs) one of my media colleagues said, he said, so you you, you think he'll, he's willing to throw it that much with Sam Ellinger? I'm like, and I love Tommy Armstrong, but I'm like, if he's willing to throw it 50 effing times with Tommy Armstrong as his quarterback, hell yes he'll throw it 50 times with Sam Ellinger or Shane Bouchelle as his quarterback. That's crazy. I, I, it's but, it, but here's my issue with that with Tim Beck. If Tom Herman doesn't like it, get on the damn headset and tell your offensive coordinator you don't like it. You're the head coach. But he's an offensive guy, too. That's why I find it hard to believe that. This has not been it. The, the game plans and the adjustments are, if if not just approved by Tom Herman, then, you know what I mean, in partly executed, help, helping to execute it. You know what I mean? I know he's got other things going on, but I'm with you. I, I find it hard to believe that Tim Beck could abandon the running game the way he has and the way he has proven That's to. That's a bad default to fall back on, Rod. That, well, like, it, you're telling me your offensive line has issues, yet in the second quarter, Matt, I don't know if you chart or not, mm-hmm. it seemed like every play was a drop back pass. I'm like, no, why? they ran it seven times and threw it seven times. Why are you? Why then are you, you had four sacks. Why are you so going to a drop? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 
looking at it. The last three plays, but I mean, we're talking about five consecutive pass plays in the final minute. So if you're really looking at the entire drive, they ran it more than they threw it. But that's looking at the whole quarter instead of just when you're in a two minute offense. But they still, I mean, it seemed, it, it didn't stand out to me, but we all saw the game, you know, differently from different views. I would like I just, to see them actually have Warren on the field more so, but it looked as if they had no success running okay, the ball. So I don't want to knock my head into a wall if you literally had ran the ball 13 times for 19 yards at halftime and it at no point was ever getting any better unless you were giving it to Foreman or letting Ellinger run it. The, the real frustration has been for Longhorn fan. We talked about the troubling trend of Tim Beck and you're talking about the reputation now of one Tim Beck. And remember, one thing about offensive coordinators, their reputations, sometimes they're unfair. I mean, a lot of times they're they're right on. Sean Watson. Sean Watson. <laughs> you know, like a lot of times they're right on about the reputation of certain offensive coordinators. And w- the one thing that I'll, I'll I'll throw out there about this offense, and I think it's been frustrating for fans. I think this is an accumulation of frustration. Still exists on the forty mm-hmm. acres. You talked about the play call. You talked about Watson. Hell, man, you got seven different play callers on the 40 acres since, what, 2010? So there have been a lot of yeah. guys calling plays on the 40 acres, different cultures. The, 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 offensive, the lack of an offensive identity is frustrating because usually an offensive identity is pretty simple. And the best way to forge one is just find a way to force feed the ball to your best football players, your best playmakers. The yep. only time we've All seen right? that in Texas during this decade was last year. Well, and Colin and, and, Johnson and, and on Foreman, Saturday. And Foreman, and Foreman was that kind of guy where yeah. it was almost – Charlie Strong kind of fell, tripped and fell into that because – he couldn't deny Deontay Foreman was the only option he had with a bad, not a bad offensive line, a subpar offensive line, and he can run behind subpar offensive line play. So yesterday, getting back to what Matt just brought up, and I was going there, Colin Johnson, he was really their their best offensive weapon. So their offensive identity, I mean, versus USC last game, was simply, at least late in the game as it evolved, mm-hmm. it was just to get the, get the ball to Colin Johnson. And, they, and if he's in man-to-man coverage, he's open. If he's yeah. in man-to-man yeah. coverage, throw it to him. He's open. He'll win the 50-50 ball. The, the, I'm frustrated because it seems to me you could do the same thing with Chris Warren in the backfield and have your passing game identity built around Colin Johnson, run game built around 250 power running back. And the point is this. What, what they don't understand about when you mm. force feed something to your best football player is defenses have to adjust. When they started force feeding the ball to Colin Johnson, man-to-man coverage, he's open, what did USC do? Hey, boy, they're doubling that dude, man. We got to put somebody on him, either up high or down low. We got to put two guys on him. Roll that damn coverage over there, man. We cannot give him that. Oh, that led to man-to-man coverage with Monty Foreman. Okay, boom. You know what I mean? It opens up other things because the defense is going to over-adjust to try to take away your strength. Right. And if you do that with the Chris Warren, you'll forge an identity there. They'll put eight in the box. They'll bring the safety down. You'll get more of Colin Johnson over the top. So I, I think the frustration is Longhorn fans don't understand why – it seems so difficult to force this identity for Tom right. And that, that's spot on. This made me just think of this right now. And I don't, first of all, before I even say it, I don't think that coaches really will long-term be trying to, you know, uh, not care about a game as much or a one-game sample. But if you look at what's to come with conference play and you look at Texas already having yeah. lost a game and that USC game is sort of the perfect way to send a message to a player like Chris Warren, before you get into conference play, when in theory all the coaches say all that matters, you even heard Tom Herman say that the only thing that matters to this team, our only long-term goal every year, is to win the conference, and then we'll find it out. What's a better time than these games to set the example that now if we see 20 carries and Warren every single play, it may be to light that fire under him and be like, How is the fire not lit after the Well, I know. I'm just throwing a theory. I don't know. But just at this point, if we see something change, it would at least align in what their envision and goal is if we get to – because we're right. We're all saying he clearly looks like the better player. you got to be crazy to not – be playing him. What is going on there if you aren't in? That would be maybe my guess that, you know, he's letting Porter, maybe not letting, but Porter is getting an opportunity if you haven't separated yourself on all days of the month instead of just on Saturdays. But who knows? Then I would just want I would just want a head coach, and I know we're probably not going to, but I would just want a head coach to come out and say that. Just come out and say, he doesn't want you to know give what? his plan away time, to the opponent. That's who, just... But this is a coach that's always talked about, hey, give him the plan. I don't yeah. care. And if you want to motivate blah, blah, blah. Chris Warren, yeah, just tell say, I want 
wanted the sure. ball in Sam's no, hands because yeah. I trusted Sam. And in this program, if you're going to be a guy we give the ball to in crunch time, you got to be a guy that we trust. Every we're giving day in the practice. we're giving the ball. We're putting the ball in the hands of the guys we trust. Yeah. If he has that and leave it at that. Yeah. Tom Herman has to explain anything more than that. If that's what the deal is, then okay, then we can read between the lines. Yeah, he just don't trust Chris Warren. Doesn't like him. Okay, great. I don't. I don't. I don't need that. I don't need him to be you're that talking transparent. About with Trey, I know he doesn't. But Rod, trust him. let me. I, want, I, want <laughs> I can read, tell. I want well, to read you we this. just are never going to get transparency from coaches for a multitude of reasons. I want, I want to read you this quote uh, from Tom Herman. This is in his Monday press conference. Uh, this was about Chris Warren and his limited carries. We've got to find a way to get him more yards. But in the middle of a game, when you see how that is shaking out, the definition of insanity is repeatedly performing the same act and expecting different results. So to keep going back to 3.8 yards per carry, I think there would be some <laughs> criticism. <laughs> Like, well, and I think that's where he would. I think more there would be some the criticism there too of Tom. Why did you give Chris Warren the ball twenty <laughs> times if he only had seventy yards? So you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Mm-hmm. Here's my thing: if you give Chris Warren twenty carries, you don't think he's gonna maybe pop one for fifteen, Man, what, twenty yards? I, I said this on this show. And we I said, said it last it week. On my show, yeah, I said it. Yes, yeah, if you is. give him the ball five times, go look at in the prime example that's that Maryland game or his you game. Give log. him the ball five times, he's probably gonna get uh, no gain to. Uh, I lost two out of those five times, but he's gonna break. He's gonna break two out of those seven five or eight yards. Or yeah, whatever. and then one's gonna be just negligible. He's gonna break one. That's how he. That's how Chris Warren works. You can't. You gotta feed Chris Warren, man. You know what I mean? You gotta feed the beast. And running backs have to get into a bit of a rhythm too. But if he doesn't want to do that, that's fine. My point is, well, it's gonna be harder for harder for you to forge an identity. Then that's fine. If you don't like Chris Warren, fine. Hey, hey, hey. You ain't got to like nobody. We they paid you five million dollars a year right. for you to make the best decision for this football team. If you believe that to be uh, di- distrusting Chris Warren, let him sit on the sideline when you got fourth and goal on the three yard line or whatever it is, uh, or the first and goal on the three yard line. First and goal on the three. Yeah. <laughs> then that's you know what we pay you good money for that. You made the right decision. But now I'm wondering, man, what the hell are you gonna do about your running game other than your true freshman quarterback? Who, by the way, has an injury history dating back to last year in high school and Shane Bouchel's hurt already, and you so loved Gerard Hurd at wide receiver, you just can't see him at third team quarterback. You know, now I'm just, now I'm just, I'm just flummoxed. I'm, right. you know what I mean, I'm dumbfounded. I don't get I it. We well, are. if you look at his game log, just to support your theory with just empirical facts and data, every game that Chris Warren's had at least 15 carries, it's 16 for 166. He hasn't had one game where he's had less than 95 yards. His games, he's had five games where he's had at least 16 carries. They are 276 yards, 106 at Baylor, 119 at Cal, 95 against UTEP, and then 166 against San Jose State. So all five games, and there it is right there. You can see it. And I'm looking at that UTEP game, and that's because – That was the one Deontay Deontay Foreman basically got the night off. Yeah, that was. was, I was going to say, why Yeah, one game didn't work that well, but Uh, see there, yeah. If you look at it, you give him 15-plus carries, he gets 100 yards basically. Hey. Like my opinion but, is, it, it, it sort of sucks that he's that type of the player that he needs is. the durability to sustain, he, and it doesn't fit with his for probably body type. He's a bigger dude, and it doesn't fit with your practice. It's just a bummer that that's him that he has to prove it for seven days a week, even though he knows when I show up on Saturday, it's game day, and I can play. That's just I'm, uh, that's I'm not saying Rod. Right, I'm not saying I'm, I'm not saying, saying he's a I'm not saying Chris Warren is a borderline Hall of Famer like the guy I'm fixing to mention. Chris Warren reminds me a lot of Eddie George. From the standpoint that I think his 16th, 17th carry are going to be much more effective than his yes. second, third, fourth carry. He's wearing, about it, that's probably in the fourth quarter sometime yeah. when that defense is tired of hitting that 250 pound behemoth. You remember the yeah. year the Titans went to the Super Bowl? I remember watching, I, I don't know, for some reason, I watched the Titans a lot that year. I, I loved watching Eddie George run. Even growing yeah. up as a Michigan fan, I didn't like Ohio State, didn't like Eddie George, but I loved watching Eddie George run. Yeah. Because, in, nice a, because in the fourth quarter, you can tell. I don't want to tackle 245 pounds coming at me downhill. Guys diving at them ankles, and he's just jumping over folks and making plays. I agree with you. I don't understand how and, – and I'm with you. I would – nothing about it. Well, we can't say I want, you know, Chris Warren and somebody else out there because we're just trying to debate to try to get Chris Warren on the field and get him more carries. But I thought they were going to have a change of pace thing. I was imagining Chris Warren in the backfield with a change of pace, Tony Carter or something. Mm-hmm. Just, you know what I mean? Just doing – but I – I don't know this uh, this vision that I had for that backfield that ain't happening because Kirk Johnson I think is the kind of that change of pace guy too. And he's, and he's hurt again. Injuries, uh, so maybe that has hurt him because he had a certain vision for the backfield about splitting up those carries and reps, mm-hmm. and he doesn't want the identity of the offense to be built around one. But if you couldn't back, depend on if you say you well, can't depend on Chris Warren, how the heck could you depend on Kirk Johnson? 
I'm, I'm, I'm at this point, like, man, I'm just throwing out theories. Well, and I think it's really, though, I really <laughs> I'm do sorry, think it's I'm down to the down offense. No, 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 but, man, it's, it's down to the offensive line. It's that simple to me. Like, I think it's the most underrated thing in all of football. You look at all NFL games, it comes down to who has the best offensive lines and who doesn't. And if you're – like, literally, Herman said today, okay. we have five guys that he even thinks – can play right now, and there's no depth, so it's them panicking you, in that no, no, situation. Right. No, no, I think you're right, but this he is just the, no look, confidence. Okay, so him. okay, I agree with you. So your your theory about the quarterback running the football, yeah. the quarterback running game versus USC, it holds water, and I think it's very valid. But it still doesn't get us past the point where at one point a running back has to carry the ball for yeah, you. Yeah, somebody okay? that needs and, to be a warning. Yeah, exactly. Because he so, can break tackles you, and go through everything. Back, yes. you, you're, I'm not your, your yes. theory. I'm not even disputing. I think it's round the money. Actually, I hope. Yeah. That is the thought process <laughs> and the rationale it, going it makes into sense. it. Because it, it makes so much sense. But it, when you do have to hand the ball off to a running back, at one point, whatever that may be, the eight times a game you actually want to do it. <laughs> the okay? guy that can neutralize uh, those having to break carries, a tackle. <laughs> why can't those eight carries go to the best possible option is my question. And the best Agreed. option is, is Chris Ward. So I agree with you. Yeah. I agree, and Which I makes right. it even more fun, McSue, no, because who's yes. the one guy that can break more break tackles tackle. off the team? <laughs> Chris Ward in the I want to say, too, he broke in the first, oh, in the first two games. Games, he broke. Oh, I want to say he broke around twenty four. I need to look. I saw tackles. it on Pro Football Focus. I did. I got the stats. The mo- one of the most run of loose run evasions, and then yeah. at the time, actually, Malik Jefferson is graded out before the USC game. He was like three missed tackles yeah. and fifty six run stops. It's pretty Ward. good. Dude, we're gonna, uh, this is such a, I just, it's such a compelling discussion. It is, but you know what? You talk, Tom Herman talked about the definition of insanity. I'm going insane because I'm just tired of seeing Texas offenses, other than really last year. I couldn't complain about that. Like, they rode Deontay Foreman hey. as far as he was going to take him. Grown man out and, there. But you go through the, like, the like uh, what was frustrating, you know, we talked about Marquise Goodwin earlier. Yep. You remember that uh, that uh, Alamo Bowl Alamo this Bowl. Oregon State? Alamo Major yep. Applewhite to OC? When, when Major Applewhite went to Marquise Goodwin and said, hey, hey, brother, you better drink, like two, to drink two Red Bulls today because I'm going to you a lot. Early and And they built the game plan around Marquise they Goodwin. They just kept throwing it deep Imagine to him. He's a man to man. just threw it up. And at some point, he's going to win one of those. Yep. Like, Rod, like, I'm not – I don't consider myself some kind of, like, X's and O's genius. I don't consider myself to know more than – Anybody else? Yes, but this true. isn't football knowledge. This is common sense. You would think it's common sense. I agree with you. Yeah, like it, it's not uh, that which, difficult. Which I, I'm telling you, to me, because I know uh, Tom Herman is mentally smarter than all of us combined. All right, got more football knowledge than all of us combined. This is because they don't want Chris Warren in that situation, either because they don't trust him or they don't like him, and they damn sure don't want him at this point. Because of whatever reason, and like Matt says, that could change in two weeks. That could change in in a month. That could mm-hmm. change entirely because the, they just he's just getting to know these players too. But they don't want that offensive identity to be Chris Warren. But if if they let's say let's say Chris they don't Warren, want that for whatever reason, I, I they don't we, we got to move on because we got to talk about other things. But yeah. if Chris Warren goes out and has twenty carries for one hundred and ten yards against Iowa State and they win the game, I'm not going to buy it. You okay, shouldn't. well, no, that's great. That's what I think you should, go do it against you should learn we'll it, for yeah. the rest of the year. It sounds like it doesn't matter what you did in the last game. If you do not practice every single day exactly. up until then, he's saying it. He's being transparent he's about saying, it the yeah. entire t- all season. He said, well, it, he's only as good as your last practice, and you got to put them all together. Here we got 10 until we get to Iowa State. We'll see yeah. where they go from My there. guess is like Matt, it's that it, it, he, he, none he's, of these are he's his been guys bad at practice or something that he did that, to t- in Tom Herman's eyes, he ain't buying in. This, this, ble- this bleeds into the uh, into the Chris Warren discussion. Do you know who I think the most underutilized weapon on this football team is? Oh, let me guess. This is good. Is it offense or defense? I, I'll, I'm not going to specify side of the ball. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, hmm. Give me a second. Hmm. I want to guess this. This might be a good. The most underutilized Under- weapon on this u- football team. Um, you gonna say Michael Dixon or something? Yeah, like I'm you. gonna say Michael. Dixon. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm gonna I say. Know, I know. I was like, yeah, man. I do it because I, I'm thinking about the best players on the team because that haven't got a chance to shine, and it's Michael Dixon because he goes the, for it all the time. With the way that defense was playing, yeah, mm. you can try to force the run because guess what? A punt for this team is a good play. Yeah. That's, like yeah, I don't know what the, field those fourth down guys. situations though at least were bo- they were close to either way it isn't like there's a glaring issue when it's fourth and short. No, no, and no you're I'm on not. The area I'm, I'm the not field. talking about. I'm not talking about the, the fourth down situations. I'm talking about in that second quarter and the third quarter where you're trying to feel your way through it. A punt's a good play at that point. Yeah. Pin them back deep. If they go, Rod, I don't know where you stand on this. This is my theory on defense, and I'm looking at this trying to put my defensive coordinator hat on, which mm-hmm. I'll never wear, but I'll wear it here for mm-hmm. hypothetical purposes. Yeah. <laughs> 
if you're going to drive the ball 95 yards on my defense, then you deserve that six. Hell yeah, you do. Yep, you know? a, yeah, I mean, that's – and I, you know what? I'll tip the hat to you. Exactly. Because that's a rarity I in just, football. Look, I, I didn't understand why they were rugby punting with Michael Dixon because that's not what he does. But I got it later when mm-hmm. you set up the fake, the fake. which worked so well. And then Beautiful. I think it was P.J. Lott got called for a hold. Mm-hmm. Which yeah, just, it was an obvious hold. Too. That's it's the ball. banging your head against the wall with special teams I corner. did the whole game because it was like one step forward, two steps back. Armani Foreman busts a kick return. And then your kick coverage is bad on the last drive. Josh Rallett makes a field goal. Reggie Hemphill fields a punt at the goal line off the bounce. Like, it's just. This one, though, was trending in the right direction. From my perspective, though, this game, all the things, even though there were flaws because this team's far from perfect, a lot of the things made me feel good about the team going forward because they actually showed, I mean, just the defensive scheme. It simplified down and it gave these players confidence and they played with a lot of confidence. We'll get to that. We'll get to yeah. that later when we talk big picture. But I want to talk. Uh, stay on offense, and we got to have the quarterback. Well, first of all, before the quarterback discussion, oh, um, the offensive line at this point is it's, it's on the verge of being a liability yes, because Connor is. Williams. Oh, do you think there's a chance? I had this discussion at lunch today. You think there's a chance Connor Williams has played his last snap at Texas? I, I, I hope. I hope so, actually, because I don't. I, I, and I, was, I, I, don't, I don't mean like I hope that yeah. he is. Played his last seven. I, mean, I, I hope, hope he's goal healthy and he's a first rounder. That's kind of my thing. I hope he's healthy enough once he once this season is over mm-hmm. and still so well thought of. Yeah, and that he decides, hey, I need to go get paid for these reps because this could happen to me again as a lineman. And I think and he the, will. The, yeah, that's kind of that's what that's that's what I meant by I hope he does. I hope he he's healthy at the end of the year and then he still drafts him to the first round. I at this point, man, I don't want him to come back here and go from being a guy projected to the first round to being a guy who's lost draft stock and now gets drafted in the Rod, first what would you season. say that what would you say the recovery is from a scope for for a torn meniscus? Four to Man, six? Man, that's I would yeah, somewhere around two months maybe. Okay, let's maybe let's let's say more. let's say six weeks. Let's say six weeks. Six I'll weeks say. the earliest he could come back would be the TCU game November fourth. Yeah, that's not worth it. And then you've yeah. only got four games left in the regular season. If I'm Tom Herman, I tell the guy, no. And no. he has sprains. Yeah, I want you like done. Nick, go, go get, if you're going to leave, get ready for the NFL. So we're probably we're saying anywhere people. anywhere from a month to two months. Yeah. And, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if he came back, knowing that kind of, knowing that guy, the kind of guy he yeah, is. Yeah, I would think he's If he just decided, hey, I'm going to set it out and just. And then, no, not come back this year, but, like, come back. Like to Texas to play another year, right? So you're saying you know just I mean? sit out the rest of the year, yeah. heal up, and then boom, and then come, and come back. back. I, I, I wouldn't agree with it. I wouldn't advise it, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did it. He he strikes me as that I, kind of guy. To me, I've heard that it. scenario makes more sense than him coming back in November. Oh hell no, he better not come back this year. That I would be upset with because yeah. he, he can hurt himself again. Right? Yeah, yeah. Now, nah, yeah. at least you go if you're going to be out. Make sure it heals up completely so you can at least play football again, regardless of whether it's on the NFL level where you're getting paid or at this level where you're projected to be still a first round. Well, and this is more of a meniscus money, repair, man. right? Because meniscus is normally about three months. But if you're looking at a meniscectomy, which may be the area between if it's just a scope, then it you might be less. But, yeah, I would be – I was just assuming he's gone for the year. There's no, no chance and yeah. there's no reason to. No reason. And even if – maybe if he wanted to in the bowl game because no. he wanted to, like, show that he was healthy. Healthy, I but I I would say I so, I already ate it on Saturday. He's gone for the year. There's so before no you get to conference play, you've lost your All American left tackle, mm-hmm. you've lost your projected starting right tackle entering the year, mm-hmm. and you've lost your number one backup on the interior, yeah. and Patrick Hudson. Yeah, done. done. All three of them done. Yeah, Williams probably not coming back. Rodriguez and Hudson, they're done. Yeah, I agree with you. That is, I mean, I mean, it's 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 bad. That it's, is bad. It's not like this isn't you know like when Charlie Strong lost his starting quarterback, starting center in the first game. Yeah, he lost Dominus Rose with an angle. You had, Yanko, you had to kick off, kick Kennedy Estelle off the team. Yeah, I forgot about that Kennedy Estelle. Mm-hmm. Desmond yeah. Harrison was like in a work release program to get out of the Texas. <laughs> I don't know what that yeah, deal it was, was all that, about. Yeah, he, Charlie had to deal with some issues too. But just getting back then, you're right. I mean, that's and that's before you even get into Big Twelve play. Yeah, that's where it hurts. And you know, I asked Tom Herman the question today because the kid's name came up twice. You're going from Derek Kerstetter being a kid that ideally you would have liked to red shirt and stashed him away. Now you probably need to go to the big fella and say, hey, we need, you need to get ready to play. It's been the case for a lot of guys, though, right? Cade Brewer. It's just, gosh, man. Out, Rod, with those, Sam Ellinger. With those, with, in an offensive line and quarterback are the two position yeah. groups that are around here for so long. It's like, man, can you just finally get to the point where you can red shirt some guys mm-hmm. and develop some guys and bring guys along? 
And now they don't have that you're luxury. back in the cycle all over again. You need those guys to play right away. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. That, now, and that's and I that's that would that's how you know Texas because I remember that's what Texas was in the you know during their run 2000 to 2009. They were red shirting a lot. A lot. Go look at all those players on that 05 team and even that 09 team. Mm-hmm. Those guys got a chance to red shirt, man. And uh, you, know, you know, grow up. Fans can say what they want about Tristan Nicholson or Patrick Vahey and what their strengths and weaknesses are. It doesn't matter anymore because that's all you got. Yeah, I agree with that. If you <laughs> want to, that's, that's all you got. Zach Shackleford and and you know, so, and Sam Sam Ellinger had a tough time trying to get the center exchange. Which Tom Herman said you know I mean? Shackleford's explanation was he thought he heard a clap. Which well, my explanation no, for that, a lot of them. This, I feel like we're talking about some of the same issues we talked about with Sean Watson. If that's the yeah, problem, yeah. why don't, don't you change up clap. your cadence yeah. when you know it's going to be loud? Why don't yeah. you go? And they did. Do you notice Sam Ellinger stopped the clap and it was just like Silent the, count. what's what Colt McCoy used to do, just count. drop his hand. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. The center has to look back and he just drops his hand. Yeah. Uh, who was it at the end of the game? That happened to Phillip Rivers with the leg count and then like he took a step up to audible and they just snapped it. I would like <laughs> to talk to yeah an offensive coordinator <laughs> at the high school or the college level and ask him what's to deal with the clap because the clap just happened. Is it a clap like yeah. <laughs> VD game? <laughs> well, Rod, the clap snap. I should call it the clap snap. Oh, it just started like, Google Google machine. Machine. like two or three years ago, maybe I started noticing it. Yeah. Urban right. Meyer, Urban Meyer did it. Ohio State was the first program I noticed Handfuls. really doing it. Started yeah. doing it, but it hadn't been around that long, right? Mm-hmm. It's a new thing. And, and I'm, I just want to know the motive. Like, is it more efficient? Like, what what have you what have studies tell, told the coaches as to why it's caught on so much? Or is it just fashionable? Well, I guess, and then at least the voice, you know, people can mimic the voices quick. I guess you can clap all over the I, field, but you can see another guy clapping if your head's true. up and stuff. But. All right, speaking of quarterbacks, Sam Ellinger, Let's go. Sam Ellinger played as gutsy a game as you can. Uh, I thought that Tom Herman said that there were some freshman mistakes. Uh, oh, yeah. Help me understand this, though, Rod. The interception he threw where it looked like his face mask got grabbed and it didn't. I thought the rule was any blow to the head or neck area of the quarterback was a personal foul. Oh, is that college football, too? That's what I thought the rule was. Oh. I, I, I that's was, the if thing. If somebody the out there watching areas. this or listening to this wants to correct me, is it co- free, well, I, I, didn't know I if it thought was co- that's I what the, the rule was. In the NFL, you have illegal hands to the head. You can't hit a quarterback anywhere in the head. So anywhere it's in the only, face. But you can do it, yeah. I guess, to other players so, by the hints of that rule being just for an NFL quarterback. Yeah, so is it the same in college? That's what I thought. No, it's not the same. Okay, I think that's what I thought. Yeah, but see, I thought that still because of just the modern evolution of safety how you have the horse collar and then if you have the face mask and if you're trying to tackle by the head if in theory you can ta- you can't tackle by the shoulder pad but you can tackle by the head it just doesn't seem like it aligns with what it should be if the idea is out of safety for the players but obviously in college they I guess haven't changed that rule he, he didn't grab the face mask he, he just grabbed the helmet right the, the helmet the, the helmet, helmet. Grazed, they tackled him by the helmet the helmet he grabbed, the the helmet and he grabbed like the the collarbone the part of the shoulder of the, pad, the front, yeah. which yeah. I don't know if that is horse collar grabbing the from the no. shoulder pad. I think it's like the name. Exactly, that's why I'm just saying it's so, yeah. awkward to see it's like that a gray area. It, and that's much. just something we may see yeah. evolve into a rule that you can't. Because in theory, you should say, I, don't, "I didn't think you can tackle by the head." But in theory, you can tackle by the head with that. Why play? do I yeah. feel like we're going to go to Big 12 Media Days next year and I'm going to sit right. on that Walt Anderson press conference and he's going to show this play and say, now this would be a personal no, foul. No, it's the same thing Ricky Williams is dreadful. I'm yeah. sure that makes Texas fans yeah. and Tom Herman feel a lot better that now it would be a personal <laughs> I foul. I mean, that's what happened. It took Ricky Williams to be tackled by his dreadlock before they went and started, started to implement the yeah, rule that you can't hang on to a person. Dreads, yeah. so it's just the same idea of a horse collar. I remember, so I remember that rule after Troy Polamalu got yanked down on an interception return, too. Yeah, couldn't grab his head. Play, yeah, yeah, which I, I always felt like, oh, uh, no, game. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you're you, the one you're leaving it out the hair, yeah, <laughs> because that means you're hair. the person that isn't growing your hair out because you don't want to get tackled by the hair. It's true. Yeah, that's what I would. Yeah, I would. I guess you want. can't tackle any any part of the upper like uh, region, Point torso, being, and everything. That's what want, makes it so awkward when you, you see the head yeah. tackling. It they doesn't get called. They don't want you pulled down from the back because apparently that blows out a lot of knees. It was like yeah. they were playing the face mask of Quan Cosby before the game on the broadcast. The USC one that extended the drive on mm-hmm. the final championship. And I mean, it's like in that situation, if you just barely miss right, right here, it's not a penalty, but it is. It's just a awkward, quirky rule. Rod, let's talk about quarterbacks. Uh, thought Sam Ellinger played guts. He did have some freshman mistakes. Of course. Um, Tom Herman said Shane Bouchelle, they'll, they'll go back to practice this week, that assuming he's healthy, which mm-hmm. it sounds like he's doing better than he was at the beginning of last week, he's going to get the bulk of the reps with the ones. Bulk of the first team reps. Here's my thing. This is the conundrum Tom Herman's in, and I don't, I don't know. 
I put a lot. I put a lot of the game plan issues with Sam Ellinger. I put a lot of the issues with Sam Ellinger. I should say on the game plan. I put a lot of it on the staff, especially in the first half, because I don't think they put him in a fair position. Don't yeah. think they put him in a position to succeed a lot of the time. But now the situation you're in is this, and this is the conundrum for Tom Herman. Do you go back to Bouchelle, a guy that through this competition throughout the spring and throughout camp, throughout the preseason, that he won the job? Do you go with him, or do you go with Sam Ellinger? Do you feel good enough about what you saw against San Jose State and what you saw late against USC that you think, hey, maybe we got we to go with this a little bit? Now now you're on the doorstep of a quarterback controversy because you've got a sample size with Sam Ellinger to be able to say, uh, maybe we ought to maybe we ought to ride this thing out and, and see where we go with this. I, I think you're past the doorstep of a quarterback controversy. I think you're in the you're in the master ba- bedroom, brother. You're, yeah, I just <laughs> and that's what's getting, so good we, about this straight one. Straight up getting it on. We, 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 were, we were at a quarterback controversy, honestly, the doorstep of it last week. Yeah. When Tom Herman changed his tone about the quarterback position. We remember after mm-hmm. the Maryland game, and I said this after the Maryland game, Tom Herman is very specific. If Shane Hel- Shane Bouchelle is healthy, he's our quarterback. Done deal. We're rolling. All right. And then after that San Jose State game, he gets his first win. Sam Ellinger starts his first game. And then it is, well, Shane needs to prove himself in practice. And then he's better have, he better have a great practice, too. And mm-hmm. I was like, I was like, damn. He went from, he went from is, he's my starting quarterback to he better prove himself. Right. And he better have a great practice. I'm like, oh, he's already changing his tune just a week later. And now we're at the point where – He's kind of coming back, you know, to Shane a little bit because I, I you know, because I think all the momentum now in this quarterback controversy, and yes, it is that, because I was on the 40 acres whenever Sam Zappelwhite, the quarterback controversy, and I got the same kind of feeling. All right? It is. <laughs> but it's good because that was a mm-hmm. true quarterback competition where, hell, both of those guys could start for, I don't know, half of schools uh, in FBS or maybe more than that. And not so much the Gerard Hurd, Tyrone Swoops quarterback uh, controversy by attrition. You know yeah. what I mean? You're so agreed. Totally. Better. And that's why this situation, if it, it, it's only what you could have wanted, what we said last week, if you see good play, like you said, it's a good controversy to be in when you have both sides performing. And it makes it even better because now if Bouchelle doesn't perform, if somebody say he gets a job, then more. If Ellinger doesn't perform, then you may be able to see. Okay, we're gonna just go with the guy that plays better. But at least now we're trending in the direction of having two good quarterbacks, like Rod was saying, which is better. And then now it's on Bouchel to perform well too, or it may make the decision easier. It may naturally settle itself I, out. I think Tom Herman knows this year something that I've been saying from the beginning of the year, and based on recent years on the Forty Acres, this has been the trend. You're going to need both of them this year. Right. Mm-hmm. You're going to need both of them regardless. Do. Yeah. So don't let either one get to the point where they're divested. You know what yeah. I mean? Right. You want, you want, that's why I think, you know, he's going to let Sam give a little love and get, to, you know, the fans going to love him. He's going to play well. And he's going to start showing Shane Bouchel more love. And you're going to be like, man, this thing going back and forth. Because I think, and I think if, if Shane gets too much momentum, he's going to do something or have a package ready for Sam to <laughs> go in there if Shane's going to be the perennial starter. He wants both of these guys to be ready. He knows this year, maybe not next year, but this year, he's going to need both of them to win. Because they're only going to both get better keeps, if that happens. And also, man, let's be, this is reality. That keeps the quarterback competition open for next year. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, one of these guys could transfer. Right. Shank yeah. it. That's what happens these days. The quarterback that's not the starting quarterback or named the starter, they usually get unhappy and they usually want to transfer. Mm-hmm. People say, oh, well, that's not really in Sam Ellinger's, uh, you know, in his character. And I don't think it is, but it may be in Shane's. Yeah, <laughs> and in both situations, like you said, then you're back to square one about the quarterback position guy. where you can't redshirt a right. quarterback, you can't develop him, you got to play him right away. Right. Yep, and I hope that this is a situation where, like you said, if you're you know sort of waving that carrot in front of one and then in front of the other, it may actually fuel them to get much better, which is something that also could have been almost making Texas more deficient at quarterback mm-hmm. the past couple of years because if you don't know that across the way, well, Gerard, he don't look like he's doing her swoops or whoever Ash or Case, everybody sort of. Just just knew the other guy isn't just going to jump up and take it from me. If you get that competitive atmosphere and both are pushing each other, maybe they actually could push each other to become better. Rod, you brought this term up last year. We are talking about the swoops Bouchelle competition, mm-hmm. rate of development. Yeah. And I think, to me, that's the exciting thing about these two guys is the rate of development for both of them still looks like it's significantly high. Agreed. Yeah. Um, the ceiling, the, you can tell what the ceiling is for both of them, and the ceiling Agreed. is high. Now, you can argue whichever one – one has a higher ceiling than the other, but the point is both these guys have shown flashes of being good, and I don't see it going anywhere but up for either of them. In terms of who you start, 
to me, that goes back to the original premise of this whole conversation. What is your identity on offense? Yeah. What do you want to be? Exactly. If you want to be a team, like Matt said, and that's what you want to do, you want to be able to have numbers in the quarterback run game, then go with Sam Ellinger. Mm-hmm. If you want to be a team that – leans on your running backs and you know numbers be damned we want to throw the ball we want to be able to have a dynamic passing game with all these weapons we got on the outside then go with Shane Bouchel now you match up against both too but until until we know what the offensive identity is then it's almost impossible to say this guy should start this guy shouldn't I I think you just hit it on the head uh I think you and I think you put it in a very articulate fashion Uh, and that's the vision of Tom Herman we don't know what his vision is right now and yeah he doesn't have all the pieces uh, to you know, p- to build his uh, vision um, perfectly, but he's got to piecemeal this thing together. So I agree with you. I, I could see the offense with Sam Ellinger. I see it as a, like you said, a quarterback running game in it uh, involved. And I think with him, they just kind of take deep shot. The passing game is going to be the deep ball with Sam Ellinger in there. You're going to suck everybody in with the quarterback running game and running the football, and then you're going over the top. You're going downfield passing game with him, and you're going to simplify things. You don't want him throwing over the middle too much. You like him throwing out there to the to the hashes, and you like him throwing deep downfield to guys like Colin Johnson in one-on-one coverage because teams are putting eight guys in the box. But with Shane Bouchel, maybe in a Big 12, Tom Herman's thinking, we're going to score some points, man. Right. I, I know that defense looked good, but I can't depend on that defense to be that dominant all the time against – Oklahoma, Oklahoma State. So maybe I need a guy that can throw the football down the field. I can I can package Sam Ellinger in a group of plays, and I can manufacture that quarterback running game with him and Gerard Hurd. But I can manufacture a a a kind of multi level, multi faceted passing game unless I have Shane Bouchard at the helm. But we don't know. We don't know. We don't what know what the vision is. You know what I mean? To and and maybe Rod the the identity of the offense. I know Tom Herman said he wants to it wants to run the ball. It wants to be an offense that runs the ball. And t- you know the the conversation uh, this summer. Uh, Tim Beck was at was at coaching school at the Texas High School Coach Association convention, and I asked him. I said, when people see this Texas offense, what do you want people to see? What do you want this offense to be known for? And the exact words out of his mouth were, "We want to be an offense that we want to be able to run the ball whenever we want." Tim Beck said that. Tim Beck said that. Man. <laughs> We want to run the ball. You to run the ball whenever uh, we want. Okay, but that's that's clearly not what's not what that's you're doing. Not what's you, happening. That's what you yeah. show me. That's not what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. your actions speak louder than your words. I think the identity of this offense, Rod. Honestly, I think the biggest strength that this staff can lean on, and why I think it's probably a good idea to go with Bouchel, I think it's this wide receiving core because as as gutsy yeah. as Sam Ellinger played, man. Oklahoma Those State. wide receivers bailed him out on they some did. throws. Like that fourth and ten door, that was that was a good throw. That was Armani Foreman making a big boy play. Even that uh and that that, that touchdown was a big boy. The cross throw. body throw but, to Lil Jordan Humphrey. Yeah. Great play to convert a second and seventeen. But it almost was a pick. The Colin Johnson no, Colin Johnson had the third down where he just straight up rips Man, the ball away yeah. from Amon Marshall. I mean, that the wide receiver position for Texas. It really is as good as it's been around here in a long time. I agree with that. And maybe that's going to be the identity of the offense, that you have so many great wide receivers, you put three or four of those guys on the field, one of them is going to be in man coverage or open in space and zone coverage. But pick and it, Shane Bouchel is more likely to find that guy. Then pick it and go with it and say we're going with Kyle Porter as our primary back because he's a better he's better at picking up the blitz and a better pass blocker. And then we're going to, we're going to go football. 11 personnel, keep Kendall Moore in there as a glorified the offensive block. lineman, yep. and we're, we're going, going to throw the football. football. Down there you go. Our running game is going to be screens to Reggie Hemphill and, and Amani Foreman on the perimeter. Something tells me, though, that – that's not what Tom Herman wants. No, I don't think. But see, here's the deal. At this point, but with you the can't offensive, get what you want. right? At this point, with you the op- with, with the offensive line situation being what it is, yeah, it's not a matter of what you want. It's what can you do? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I, and I think uh, that's why Sam Ellinger may fit right now. It might be a little bit more compatible right now because he can extend some of those plays. Maybe he can improvise a little bit better when that play breaks down. The play's going to break down a lot quicker right. now, too. Right. He can improvise. He can extend the play. We saw it versus USC, what he can do. Um, and he's a freshman, so you got to deal with the growing pains. But I'm going to at this point, you just got to look at what, what options give you the, most, the mo- give you the best chance to put the most points on the board. And if it's through the passing game, you got to go with Shane Bouchelle. If it's through the running game, meaning you limit the amount of possessions for the other team, control the clock a little bit more of the running game, keep your defense off the field from being exposed, and look at a more of an overall team picture of how to win and play the field position game a little bit more, maybe use Michael Dixon more, then that's a that's that's a diff, that's an overall team approach you gotta take. 
Right. You know what I mean? Because in the Big 12, you ain't going to outscore people. Right. This offense ain't outscoring no damn body. I feel mm-hmm. like we're back. It's not to, how they're going to win games. I feel games. like we're back to 2014 all over again. I remember that. Yeah, you're right. Great Where you're defense. You're on the verge of having, don't have def- an offensive a line. defense that's going to keep you in every game, but an offense is not going to allow you to go win every game. That's a great point. Yeah. Which means maybe you should think about letting your defense win games for you. Then you got to talk about ball control. Uh, then you got to think about, you know, field position, things of that nature, which, you know. I would figure out a way to use both quarterbacks because I think both I think you can win with both these guys, and I think they both they're both different enough to where you can make it work. Man, so now you're back to what what year was that? When Texas was rotating quarterback, 2012, Uh, yeah, yeah. eleven, yeah, (laughs) eleven. Yeah, so now we're back in 2011, 2014. I'll, I'll take, I'll we're take, like going back in time. I'll back take Shane Bouchelle and Sam Ellinger over David Ash and Case McCoy. Oh, yeah, that's – But I'll take those run- – right What well, about the running backs? So I'll take those running backs from back Yeah, then. I'll take uh, – <laughs> I'll, I'll take uh, – Fozzie Whitaker was Fozzie back then, Whitaker right? Fozzie Whitaker and Joe Bergeron. Malcolm, Malcolm Brown, Brown was – Malcolm Brown and Fozzie in the league right now. And because of the Texas offense by Danny Crisis, neither one of them got drafted. Yep. <laughs> and both of them are NFL caliber They're backs. multi-year league guys. They're working. Fozzie's probably already got enough service time yeah. to get his pension. That's now. how bad the I offensive think. identity crisis has been on the 40 acres. It's going to hurt some of these guys, too. They'll go in the, in the league and end up playing, but they won't get drafted because they didn't get to show enough in college. Oh, jeez. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll end the show talking some big picture stuff. We, we mentioned the defense. And Rod. Oh, yeah. Nobody saw this coming. Uh, None of us could have no. seen this coming. This defensive effort. And here's what I like the most about it. Yeah, it was, we, it was fun the, to watch. Yes, the defensive and offensive, the defensive line made plays and made one-on-one plays that they hadn't made through the first two games. And Malik Jefferson and Anthony Wheeler as a duo looked like the duo I saw on the field at the Under Armour game yeah. when they were recruits and thinking, holy crap, if Texas got both these guys, it, it's going to be on at linebacker. On. But the one thing that I love the most about Todd Orlando's game plan is he decided we're going to find one thing that we can take away. And we're going to take away one thing. Mm-hmm. And that one thing was the inside zone running game. Yep. It wasn't there. They made an effort to say if we, we – they I you, can, you can't – an offense as dynamic as USC, you can't just play them straight up. Otherwise, just yeah. go with God and hope for the best. Agreed. But they made a point. We're going to take away the inside zone running game. And USC kept hammering it and hammering it and hammering it, and it just was not there. The only success they had running the ball rod was the times that they either ran mm. outside zone or one of those backs bounced it to the outside. Yeah. So credit Todd Orlando for coming up with a great game plan. But the one thing that I think can kick, because stylistically you're going to have to do some different things in the Big 12 with all these spread offenses that make you defend more of the that, field. That, that was not the type of offense that Texas will be facing Correct. in the Big 12. Not which, even close. Which is yeah. something to keep in mind. Yeah. But the one thing, Rod, I think that can carry over is I cannot remember the last time I saw a Texas team tackle in space as well as this team did. Mm. On uh, Saturday. I, I agree with that. I, I will take it even further. I don't know if I've seen the defensive backfield play this well since Earl Thomas was in the secondary with that game. High praise. Considering the opponent they're playing against. you know, I mean, And what Sam we had Darnold. seen the first two games. And what we had seen the first two games. I had not – I mean, there were a few guys, and, you know, there were a couple of guys on offense too. <clears throat> well, Colin Johnson was the one guy on offense. Well, Sam Ellinger too. Um, where you've seen them play their best game they've ever played in the history of their careers on the 40 acres versus USC on that big stage. Uh, Anthony Wheeler might have had his best game ever. Deshaun Elliott Mm -hmm. might have had the best game you've ever seen from him. Hell, Charles Minnow, who had one hell of a game, too. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some guys. Might have been Puna Ford's best game. Puna Ford might have had his best game, too. I mean, there were some guys like, I don't think I've ever seen this guy play this well. I've been watching him for like two and a half years (laughs) now. And that's a credit to Todd Orlando and a credit to the pride of the group. Um, and there are some guys, Malik and Holden Hill. Holden Hill's going to be an All-American, by the way. Holden Hill's playing like the best corner in the Big 12 right now. Yeah. There's not a corner in the Big 12. For the third for the third game in a row when the you're seeing the row, same stuff. Yeah. Man, he's uh, – yeah, I, I need I, – I didn't want to totally believe it. You know, some of that stuff, you know, he's getting non-offensive touchdowns. Like, okay, he may have just had a really, really lucky day. Maybe he should go buy a lottery ticket. Man, mm-hmm. yo, man, you might be set. And, you know, the second game versus San Jose State, he played well, but everybody played well versus San Jose State, and they, get, they got the shutout, which is – an admirable thing. Trust me, they, they, they're hard to come by. Versus USC, man, Houghton Hill was a lockdown corner. And literally make – I mean, all he did was pretty much make great open field tackles. That was just kind that of standout fourth, play. That fourth down stop fourth was down the best – that yeah. was the be- maybe the best open field play I've seen a Texas D. It was unbelievable. Make, and I don't even know how. Long. Yeah. It was. It, there were crossing routes, crossing routes, uh, kind of shallow crosses designed to pick off the two defensive backs. So the defensive backs would either run into that. the wide receiver and or run into each other. He goes around 
the he goes around the wide receiver. So there is plenty of separation. I was just get th- maybe three yards mm-hmm. in between him and the wide receiver when wide receiver catches the ball. And the wide receiver has got, I think, like half of half. the field to like run, like try to outrun him to uh-huh. like the sideline if he chose to. And Cl- Holden Hill not only closes the gap so quickly that the, the guy decides, oh, I got to cut it back because I can't beat him to the corner, and then makes the open field tackle when he's cutting yeah. back. Dude, it was that I rewinded that play like eight times. I told my girlfriend, I said, it might be the best damn play of the game, but it won't get a lot of love. This was as tough it. as hell to do. And especially on that wet field that was oh, already the first the sod was falling out of underneath people's feet the very first couple of plays. Like they yeah. play so much football there. And for him to make that play and have it's it right when he's cutting back against it's it, it was, was perfect. I mean, you literally thought there was no way he could keep him short. And then he actually gained no yards and lost half a yard back and was two and a half away. It was yeah. insane. It was I mean, one of those deals, Rod. I gave it my hit of the game, and it wasn't like a bone jarring. No, hit, but it was so that's important. what I've been talking about. Where it was so I, important. I just want to see, as, and I've been harping Sound. on this. I want to see a Texas DB leverage the ball properly and then come to balance and make a play in space. It was, and Rod, you can't coach it better than that. You really can't. I mean, it was unbelievable. And another thing I thought was interesting. I mean, obviously, you know, the defense getting after Sam Darnold. I think they sacked him three times. Picked him off twice, and he ended up having like a, a decent stat line in the end. But if you watch that game, even after the game, he admitted, "Man, I struggled versus that defense." Like he admitted, "Like man, that yeah. that defense was tough. Yeah. Like, they came out ready to play, and they were asking him like to give props to his teammates. And he kept he kept uh, like basically uh, giving props to the Texas defense. Right. Um. So I'll I'll say it, man. I think that if this defense plays this good, they can be the best defense in the Big Twelve. And I know. That that's a tall order because I don't think we've ever seen this before. It's like invasion of the body snatchers. I don't know what the hell that was. So hmm. I, you know, I, I I I am a little bit hesitant to say, oh, they can do this every game, and because it'll change up in the Big Twelve. You got Mason Rudolph and Oklahoma State looks like a freaking football machine. Mm-hmm. Like, I, what happened with Greg Robinson that, when he showed up and the defense changed? It was like you have yeah. a different team out so, there right now. But give give Tyler no credit. We challenged him after Maryland. Everybody was like, that was a disgrace. He admitted that it was a disgrace, that it was embarrassing. He's had a shutout since. And then this performance versus USC where that mm-hmm. front seven was the most dominant force on the field. It was I, I had never seen uh, Malcolm Roach and Chris Nelson and Charles Amin, who and those guys played play at that oh, with that kind even of edge. Wilbon. Wilbon was that, in the backfield on three consecutive plays there. I mean, it was down inside their own goal line. It was impressive. They played like they had been listening to Tupac before the game. Like on, a, on, a thir- on a third down <laughs> late in the fourth quarter, Jeffrey McCullough comes up with one of the biggest McCullough. plays of the game. Yeah. No, it really was. They all, like, I saw a couple, I, you know, I, I saw a couple of breakdowns. I mean, the situational football, let's talk about it while we're talking about the defense so we don't just uh, make it all about, you Rosie. know, sunshines and rainbows. The situational football at the end of the first half, where well, they give up the the, the late touchdown mm-hmm. to, to to Ronald Jones, and then at the end of regulation, where forty five seconds left in the game, and they give up the the, the drive that leads to the game tying field goal to go to overtime, lapses in uh, execution for them, and you know I, I haven't looked at the film to break it down and see exactly what happened at those times, but. Um, I just think it was just them. They literally lost their focus. They for sixty minutes they were focused, and not sixty minutes. I would say fifty eight minutes. Yeah, yeah fifty nine, whatever minutes they were focused, and they lost focus for I don't know ninety seconds, and they gave up ten points because of it. Yeah, yeah. pretty much. You know what I mean? Um, and the and the game. Mm-hmm. And no, the game. game. I mean that, that was the game. They, at the end of the half. regulation. Everybody and now and my girlfriend's screaming. She's yelling. She's going crazy. And I'm sitting there. She's like, "What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you?" I was like. It ain't over. It ain't. It's not over. Mm-hmm. Not against an NFL quarterback. And I've seen this team give up things. I was like, nah, it ain't over. I say I, this guy's got some magic. He's got his, he's got some it quality too. He pulls out when he needs to pull it out. We saw it from Sam, and you saw it from you saw it from both Sam, Sam Ellinger and Sam mm-hmm. Darnold. He's got we, some it quality. He even looked dude. like a little mini version of him. Ellinger the, did of Darnold. Yeah. Like they they, they just looked the same in the Darnold helmet. Darnold struggled, but man, those two same or three throws type. that he made, like the one in the back of the end zone for the touchdown mm-hmm. when he scrambles. Dude, that, that that's an NFL throw. It's just hard to see guys make yeah, throws and, like that. Yeah, Darnold by the second half would just play great. The first half, he missed a few open receivers that well, made the receivers me feel dropped good. a lot of passes yeah, too. Yeah, I mean, I was just, yeah, I would, but that's where we out. got lucky right there we early did. on when those few things happened and yeah. things were going our way, and you kept them scoreless. You knew that then it was going to be a sixty-minute game. I think te- I think Texas punched USC in the mouth, and I don't think USC was ready for it. I don't think that offense was ready for it. 
Cause I don't think they were ready for that defense. No. Respect that they hadn't seen it was. on film yet. Yeah, <laughs> that def- I, I wasn't ready for that. No, 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 nobody, nobody was, was ready for that. They're like, damn, they the, bite. The Whoa. only people in that 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 knew Texas was gonna play like that maybe was the Texas uh guy, Texas players on that defense in that locker room. Other than that, there was no reason to think they were going to come out and play the best football we've seen that defense play in two years since uh, Charlie Strong's win over Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. And honestly, they may have had a better defensive performance than that. I got to go look yeah. at that that Oklahoma game and see. But they, I think it may have been more impressive and, than that. You know, I talked about this on the show last week, but Malik Jefferson, I just felt like he was you know, he was going to have a great game. I just he felt did. like it. I don't know yeah. why. Man, he was real amped up when we talked to the players last Tuesday. You know, he was just – Big could, stage, man. You he can tell, be. man. He's Scouts just, are watching, bro. And I talked to him about it after the game, and talk was talking about the run defense. And he looked at me and he said, "Point." He said, "Point blank." He said, "They were not going to run the football on us." Hmm. He said, "We came in here with that mindset. They were not going to run the football on us." Yeah, I was surprised that USC didn't try to attack uh, corners more uh, coming out. Like I, I thought they would try they to did do late. that initially. They did late. I thought they'd do it early. Yeah. You know what I mean? I thought to get double moves and go deep balls early. And I thought they'd do it on Chris Paul. Devontae Davis actually – did he did he start the game? Due to yeah. – Due to something like issues. Disciplinary issues. Disciplinary Chris issues. Boyd. Okay. Um, yeah, I saw that. That's even more reason. I thought, oh, Devontae Davis. I thought they'd go, check, check, check. Yep. <laughs> check, check. You know what I mean? I never saw that by Sam Darnold or by USC. And I expected to see that. And they didn't attack our corners. They did late but not early on. But, uh, man, Rod, this defensive effort, uh, you know, I, it's it's unrealistic to expect them to do this every week. But if this kind of becomes the trend, then they will have a defense that keeps them in every game. It's yep. just what is this offense going to do to supplement that? And yep, along those lines, as we close out the show this week with, with the time we've got left, we've seen this before. And this is the frustrating thing with this program over the last few years. We've seen a game, whether it's a win or a loss, where you feel like, okay, this is now the chance where you've got a, you can start building something from this. Mm-hmm. You can build off this. Charlie's first year, it was that Oklahoma loss where they outplayed Oklahoma in every possible way except the scoreboard. The following year, it was the Oklahoma win, win. Yeah. the win over Oklahoma. What did you do after those two games? Lost. The first year, you went out in 14, and two weeks later, you got shut out on the road against K-State. And then in, in 15, you went out two weeks later, and you got shut up by Iowa State names. Mm-hmm. So you did nothing with those two games. Yeah. And then last year, we all thought it was the Notre Dame game. Yeah. Well, I thought the Notre Dame game was – and then as P.J. Locke told me at Big 12 Media Days, we went out to Cal and boo-booed all over ourselves. Yeah. So every time in Charlie Strong's tenure, this program had a chance to build off of a game, win or lose a game where you can hang your hat on and put that game on the wall and say, this is what it's supposed to look like. Each and every week, they didn't do it. And I thought it was funny that Tom Herman, we were talking about today, he kept getting questions about how can you keep this going? How do you how do you worry about not having a letdown against Iowa State? And he made the comment, he says, some of you guys sound like you've got PTSD. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, we do, because we've seen this before. I like that, though, from him. <laughs> this is a very ugly, bad rerun that we've seen one and too many times. And that's what's really good, though, to see, though, because that's us, funny. we are viewing this as the Texas program. Tom Herman is viewing it as, no, that's never happened to me in my program. Why would y'all put those type of memories to what I do not possess? So I li- I at least see where he's coming from and like that our coach sees that because he does feel separate from it. But then us as fans, yeah, you still are going to remember those things because when you're hurt, it sticks with you. And it's like we said it's been a fear-based fan base for about you know five years now. That's the one good thing that when you are tr- hiring somebody to come in and fix it, that's a guy that doesn't even know that identity, and it's foreign to him. Don't so. bring your old baggage into new relationships, yep, people. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, leave the old baggage, leave Charlie Strong's baggage with Charlie Strong era. This is Tom Herman. Trust me, Tom Herman's got his own baggage to deal with. He's got to, it's, it's piling up already. Mm-hmm. Just in terms of just, Chris Warren and so, Tim Beck and everything. For, it's good news to hear Forgive that. me if Texas goes out and plays well against Iowa State, and, and I don't think it's that big of a deal. Because guess, no. guess what? Get ready to go again because you got K State coming to town the week That's after. What's good about college? And then you got, you the got a new workforce yeah. every four years. It's like in the NFL, certain teams and people can keep together, but that's one good thing. You got a new batch of kids coming in in a couple of years, and it's going to be a different crew, see how they perform. Uh, Oklahoma and Oklahoma State will be the test. Uh, if they perform, if this team does not 
uh, perform up to expectations versus Iowa State or Case because Case State lost to Vanderbilt. Yeah. All right. So K State may not be as good as everybody thought either. But that's actually bad for Texas because you want you want to catch K State early before they always have that loss where like man K State's hmm. terrible and that then they end up winning nine games at the end of the year. This is what K State does. Yeah. Uh. So you know with, with Texas, I think that's the measure it because you perform like this because USC. The expectations now are that you will go out and handle business versus Iowa State. But as you pointed out, we've seen this team sack before. This team does not know how to win. They're still learning how to win. They right. didn't even win versus USC. Right. All right. That's the whole point. That moral victories are not good enough. You should you should that 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 loss is hard to, you know, put it this way, but that loss should give you a little bit of confidence, but you gotta understand that, that still was a loss. Mm-hmm. And there was a loss, man. So you, you, you're not yeah. even close to where you need to be. Which may even up. help the team more. Well, I, I'll give you the best <laughs> example of that. So I texted with a team source of mine after the game just to kind of tip my hat for that defensive effort. Say, hey, yeah. man, that's – Great job. Yeah. And the text I got back was, yeah, but we still lost. Still lost. Yeah. And that's the kind of – that's honestly the kind of mindset I want to hear. Like, yeah, yeah guys, they're not happy because, oh, we played it close. No, they're pissed off because we had a chance to beat the number four team in the country in their house and didn't do it. Yeah, let fans uh, participate and take joy in the moral victories. That is a gateway to complacency for those guys. I walked I walked back up the tunnel with the team as they were getting a standing ovation from the USC fans, and that was not a team that was pleased with a, a moral victory. That was a team pissed off because they lost. You should have Because they got that close and fell short. Exactly. You were right there. It's like celebrating because you were in the friend zone. Man, it's not good. And, and I, I, I don't I, take no celebration in that. Brad, I told Matt this before you got in here. The, 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 the one thing in my mind from that game that will stick out more than anything, after the eyes of Texas was over, um, the first guy I saw standing in front of me was Malcolm Roach, and he mm. kind of spit his mouthpiece out, and I'm like, you know what? Coaches always talk to players, whatever level of football you're at. Hey, leave everything out on the field. And I'm looking at that guy. I'm like, that is a guy that had absolutely – he didn't have one drop of sweat, yeah. one tear, one drop of blood. He had nothing left in his tank. Yep. But even though he probably felt good about that effort, you could tell on his face, it's like, man, I did all that, yeah. and we still came up short. Texas fight. It was Texas fight for 60, whatever, 65 minutes, whatever it was. But. You know, everybody, you know, I was down in the tunnel and like Matthew McConaughey was shaking hands, shaking hands. I loved coach's it when I saw that burn orange jacket yeah, on him again. I was like, that's the same jacket from the last one. Shaking hands <laughs> with support staff and Governor Abbott's down yeah. there. And yeah, man. VY's there. And everybody's like, hey, great effort. But Tom Herman and those coaches and the support staff, they're like, yeah, but we lost. You we know. had a chance to do something really special, and we came up short. Yeah. So maybe that mentality is going to carry this team over, and they can build it on It was this. a step, man. It was a serious step. I'm hoping that it will, it, it'll, we'll see another one uh, in two weeks when they play. I didn't think I was going to yell on this podcast, but I did this week. Yeah, so. hey, nothing wrong with that. Uh, oh, Matt, we got some picks to make before we get yes, out of here. Yes, sir. We're going to start um, it off. And, uh, and hey, whoa, 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 whoa. The one week I win the pick em, we can't gloss over that. Oh, oh, yeah, three and two. Jeff was three oh, and two. Rod was nice. two I didn't and know three, that. and I was one and four. And would you like to point out which game made the difference for me? Uh, your difference from me was and Rod was the cow game. And yeah, the body clock game. issues. The body clock yeah, issues. Yeah, I called that cow old miss. <laughs> there you go. Hey, I'm going to gloat. I lose every week. I've never won a damn week since we started doing this. So I'm going to enjoy my victory. You should, actually. I had the Don Juan at one in a million for lunch. So, so what's the nice. final? What's the, what's the standings? So right now, Rod's leading. He's 9-6. and six. I am 8-7. and seven, And Jeff is 7-8. and eight. So Boom, let's go. So one, I'm right there. I don't, have to really, I don't have to take the, the, the big gamble anymore. And right. I don't want to finish. My goal is just not to finish last. That would be smart. Yeah, don't do that. First. yeah, you don't want to All right, first. first game, Notre Dame against Michigan State. Who you got? <sighs> I don't really trust either of these teams. Man, Ooh. this was a tough one. Notre Dame versus Michigan State. That's ugly. Yeah. Uh, I'm going. Where is this game, Matt? Uh, Michigan State. I'm going Indian Michigan State. Lansing. Yeah. Notre Dame. Mm. Fool's gold. Let me look at Michigan. Who's Michigan State's player? <laughs> well, I'm going to go with the favorite Notre Dame, even though I, I probably should go Michigan State. Yeah, I'm going they, Michigan State. Let me throw this in my Google machine real quick. All right, while you do that, Houston and Texas Tech. I think I'm, this is good. a very intriguing game. Yep, you I'm see the line be going on this right now? Yeah, yeah, it's going to be see, Houston favored by six. Yeah, Cooks, how, Cooks by six. You see how many uh, – didn't Shimanek – I like to say his name, Shimanek. Didn't he have six touchdown passes last game? I just game? didn't even know his name until yeah. just yeah, like right now. Yeah, like 500-something pass yards, dude. Yeah, they know they got a, they got a prolific Brady pass on offense. Um, man, U of H – 
versus Tech. Put me down for Michigan State against over and over. Where's you? Where's the game again? Is it U of H? Uh, Houston, Houston. Houston. Yeah. Oh, I will take U of H then. I'll take U of H here. Yep, I'm yeah. taking U of H as well. I'll take U of H though. Yeah. I'm kind of leaning. Let me come back over to that one. Shimanek. All right, then going on, Arkansas and A&M. Who you got? This is uh, and to use oh. wrestling. Oh, well, I got a wrestling story before we close out the show, by the nice. way. Um, this is the old, probably the old wrestling match, the loser leaves town match. Mm-hmm. That's probably what this is between <laughs> Brett Bieber and Kevin Sumlin. Losers, <laughs> losers probably going to be kicked out of town. <laughs> That's so funny. They have matches like the, he was banished forever. Hey, a guy, if a guy's going to another promotion, he's he got to kick him out somehow. So he loses, loses, leaves town. Oh, catapult, load promotion. up the catapult Kevin and shoot Sullivan. him over a wall. Ooh, this is tough. Yeah, A&M's, who's more desperate? A and M has played like garbage the last two weeks, especially in the first half of their games. But I don't. Arkansas looked bad against TCU, and I don't know how good TCU is. Really, I know their defense is really good. They're, yeah, their defense um, is decent. Man. Do we have to pick a winner? Let's get I'm going to – is it at Arkansas or at it's a It's at Jerry World. Yeah, it's going to be Jerry, Jerry World. I'm going with the Aggies. Man, I'm going to – I think the Aggies, Aggies have more talent. That's pretty obvious. Uh, but they quarterback situations in shambles. You I'll, said Houston? I'm still debating on that All right. one, Matt. I'll Come go – damn it, man. That's tough. I'll go – I hate picking the Aggies. A&M's, they always A&M's screw me. down to just Kellen Mond I know what so I'm right? saying. The quarterback situation is a – Dumpster fire. <laughs> you know I'll what? go Arkansas. I'm going to go Arkansas. Arkansas. I'm going to go Arkansas because Arkansas has been so close to beating A&M and all, yeah. something always goes wrong. So I think this is a year and Arkansas. And A&M's come close to not losing, but they had way too close ball games against subpar competition the last two weeks. So, this yeah. is, this. yeah, I th- I actually think this will be a close game, but I think Arkansas wins. House right. that Johnny Bill's turning into a crack house. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, you're right. I like that. Uh, moving on. Stanford, UCLA, who you got? Oh, UCLA. Oh, man. Yeah, Josh. Is it Josh Rosen? Is his name? Yeah, yeah, where yes, is this is. game, Matt? Is this a. This game is in Stanford. He That's struggled Stanford. last week. But you know what? A body clock, man. Playing that 11 a.m. game at Memphis. But Stanford, think, UCLA? Yeah. yeah. I'll go. I'll go. Stanford. Stanford just lost to San Diego State. Damn it. I'll take I'm going Stanford, Stanford too. I'll go Stanford. I like David Shaw. I got I got faith in David Shaw. You know Shaw. what? I, I think UCL, UCLA to me is kind of a lesser version of USC. I think they got they got a dynamic passing game with Rosen. They do. Um, don't know if Jalen Phillips from UCLA is going to be available. I didn't see. He, I know he was injured against Memphis. I don't even know if he came back in the game or not. Um, give me UCLA. I'll take UCLA. Nice and since Texas. And, and go ahead and put go ahead and put me down for U of H over Texas Tech. Oh, right. nice. So Jeff went. So with I think UCLA, the Cougs actually Stanford, play some defense. And Rod went Stanford there too. Yeah. Cool. And then uh, yeah, because Texas isn't playing, had to find a fifth fifth game. They all pretty much are crap. So let's go. Uh, all crap. Yeah, Florida, Kentucky. Who you got? Oh, Florida. Florida. Yeah, Florida's only favored by three at Kentucky. Yeah, so that's Florida Kentucky, hadn't looked Kentucky great. Kentucky just got a win over our spirit animal here. I'm so well, well, Must Champ, they beat Must Champ. And Florida yeah. got that big win the last minute over oh, Tennessee. Tennessee, right? I just yeah. saw that before the show because I missed that while yeah. traveling. Man, As a defensive back, man. What's, such your a, rule, what's your rule on a Hail Mary, Rod? Just stay deep in the defense and, and that knock one wasn't it down. Even a Hail Mary. It that was, was a Hail a Mary. Post. Yeah. Just it was a post them. route. And it was the last play of the game, and – the defensive back passed them off to the safety. The yeah. corner I'm like, it's the last play. Run with the deep ball. I don't get it. I don't get it. That Man. was hilarious. Football IQ. Anyway, uh, I will go with Florida. Same where, here. Where is this game, man? In Kentucky. Yeah, I think Florida's going to be. Bluegrass. Um, Bluegrass. Yeah, I'll go with Florida. All right, we're a consensus on that Florida. one. So, yeah, plenty of disagreements. So what's there. gonna what's gonna be the difference? Uh, Michigan it's gonna State, come Notre down Dame? to the Notre Dame game, the Aggie game, and the Stanford game because we all took Florida and all took Houston. Okay, so go over the, the those go over those three games again. So I don't think Rod and I had Michigan State, right? Yep. Yeah. And I had Notre Dame. Okay. Then I also had the Aggies. Y'all had Arkansas. Yep. And then Rod and I had Stanford, and you had UCLA. All right. Go. Yep. That'll be about our picks for it. Boom. Black Stradamus. Yeah, Rod's going to win the pick em this year. This is no question I'm going to win the pick em. So here's what I we're going to do. Here's, here's, what, here's what we're going to do. No, here's what Rod, if you win. MyBookie.ag. <laughs> nice plug. <laughs> By the way, Rod, even though I had lunch today before I came over here, I heard your uh, 
your voice ads for Myers Elgin Sausage. Myers ah. Elgin Sausage. I, I remarked about that. That is like my dad only eats Elgin Sausage. Yeah, see? And my Boom. dad did. And I told Crumb that on the way in. I'll get, I'll get, I'll I'll get some free sausage for you, dad. My father was a huge fan of, uh, of Myers Sausage. Who? And for everybody watching on video, I apologize. I'm a mess. I've had a shoelace untied. I keep knocking my computer charger out of the socket, so I apologize. I'm just a big, a big <laughs> I don't think today. they can see your shoe. <laughs> Matt, thanks for everything, man. <laughs> You're more than welcome. Rod, we appreciate the time and the knowledge. Anytime, brother. Anytime. For Matt, for Rod, for everybody at 104.9 The Horn. 104hornfm.com. You can get Rod, the Rodcast every day from 1 to 3. That's right. Get that on uh, the Horn SoundCloud page. Mm-hmm. And you can get this podcast on the Longhorn Blitz SoundCloud page. And thanks to Matt, you can get us on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, any podcast app yep, out there. Yep, just type in Longhorn Blitz. You'll find a transparent talk show. I'll tell you about <laughs> shoelaces. <laughs> <laughs> for the whole for the horn F, for the horn family for the horns 24 7 family i'm jeff howe thank you so much for downloading and listening and we will catch you again on the next episode you've been listening to longhorn blitz with horns 24 7.com remember for the latest longhorn news 24 7 visit horns 24 7.com